everyone, and welcome to Health Space Unmasked. Thank you, Reed. It's always a good reminder of why we're doing this. We have been doing this since 2020, and it has been hugely successful. We average almost five to 600 registrants, and we get over 100 people on here in the mornings, on a Saturday morning, ready to learn and ready to engage with each other. We do love it if you uh, put your videos on, if you want to come together in a community. This is your opportunity to be virtually around a table with Jason and Reed. Um, these two amazing um, pioneers in the in the health space. And so here we're going to start off with Reed, and he will talk for about 20 minutes and gives us, give us some pretty cool insight into FDN and how it relates even to what Jason's going to talk about around mold. And then I'll introduce Jason, and we will keep on going. And we'll be here until probably for until 1030. Have your questions, answers. Be, use the um, chat. Be engaged with each other. We are here to really communicate be in community together. So grab your drink and enjoy this um, next couple hours that you're gifting yourself of time um, to learn. Go ahead, Reed. Thank you, Kimri. Hopefully that drink is coffee or some related substance. <laughs> uh, you know, I got my cup here. It is beautiful when you put your cameras on. I think what we should have is a prize for the best pajamas. <laughs> you know, since it's Saturday morning. You know, flannels or whatever it might be, um, uh, silk pajamas. You know, you never know what you might see, right? You never know. So, uh, and thanks to other staff, um, we do have a Q and A session at the end, and uh, of course, you can chat up. And I believe there's questions you can um, you can submit, and we'll get to those. We'll read those off for you. But at the end, we hope you'll turn your cameras on and, and say hello and ask your question live. This is an interactive, highly engaged audience most of the time. And for those of you who don't know much about FDN, uh, I'll just give you a really quick background. I teach a course in functional lab work as it applies to all natural, drug-free, lifestyle-based protocols. So yes, anything that's a matter with you that you you have an unwanted health condition? Is there such a thing as a wanted health condition? I don't know. Just good health, that's all. But if you have a, a something that concerns you about your health and you want to get rid of it, you might want to talk to an FDN practitioner because I guarantee you they're highly trained. My program, or our FDN program, which has a life of its own now, I hesitate to even call it mine. I did found it. But man, has it grown uh, since the last century, <laughs> basically. So it's really grown in scope and in the educational training. What I'm going to do now for just a few minutes is turn to some of that training. I think I'm going to go to module five, lesson three or something like that. Let me share my screen and uh, get started with that. And you'll see the tie-in. When Jason comes on in just a few minutes, you'll see... I'm giving you some background on what happens physiologically. How does the body break down? And I hope you like it. And so I'm going to go into uh, presentation mode here and show you a slide that uh, I worked on. And I also get help from our mentorship team. I, I have my own mentors. I have, uh, and I never use the word guru, and I'm not one, and neither are you. <laughs> so um, everyone uses this statement. I hear it all the time, and it's just, in my opinion, not true. They say all disease begins in the gut. Even Hippocrates, who considered the father of modern medicine, I think was off on this. And not that I could argue with him, but um, I will say that it certainly circles around to the gut so often that it could be considered. People are thinking it's the it's the reason, you know, you go to a doctor. Oh, it's all in the gut. Well, really, what we have, you probably heard this word before, stress. If you haven't heard that word before, well, you've probably been under a rock for the last 10 years or something. But so we have this idea that stress is highly increased today, all the different things. And it puts us in the sympathetic overload, meaning your nervous system, which regulates every cell in your body, gets excited. Sometimes it gets pissed. Other things happen. Now, because we're a lab course, we're course in lab work. 
We measure things. We get some saliva, urine, blood, stool, hair, skin, you know, whatever it might be. And we look at it and we get measurements. We get data. And one of the things we notice right away is that the cortisol to DHEA ratio goes out. Cortisol DHEA are your main metabolic hormones. You have metabolism, which is the activity of every cell, tissue, organ uh, in your body. You have metabolism, and it's in two main categories. It's in catabolic, represented by cortisol, and DHEA represented, or pardon me, the anabolic, represented by DHEA. You know who the most anabolic people are? Kids, because they're growing. And it's really interesting. They have this catabolic anabolic balance that leans towards the anabolic, the growing, the uh, replacement of old cells or development of new cells and that kind of a thing. Now, when we get older and we get kind of increased stress, it starts to break down. We end up more catabolic. And that's why we measure. We, we want to see where are you? Where are you? And all that is within this analysis of what we call the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. In other words, the HPA axis. That's, that's looking at how your body responds to stress in a big way. And a very thorough, complete, data-driven way. And oh, by the way, oh, by the way, if you have this catabolic to anabolic imbalance, it could be corrected. But the next thing to go is sex hormones because this DHEA is the parent of testosterone and uh, estrogen and a lot of the sex hormones. And so we see that too. So people with stress have sympathetic overload. They're more likely in fight flight. You can see it on paper, which is so interesting and so helpful because you go, oh, now I know why I feel like shit, pardon my French, and why my sex hormones are out of balance. And so, but the next thing to break down is secretory IgA in the gut. You've all heard that the gut is most of your immune system, like 80%. And we get the CIGA gets compromised. Why? Because the high cortisol suppresses secretory IgA. And you might have symptoms like gas, bloating, heartburn, indigestion, uh, you know, diarrhea, constipation. It gets worse. And also, because you have uh, this compromise, you have a dysbiosis, you, you now are out of a balance in a different way, in a new way. Oh, how much fun is that? Not only do you have the gas and bloating, heartburn, indigestion, but you also, and by the way, you could be symptom-free. You could still be symptom-free at this point. But a lot of people show up with complaints. And with a dysbiosis, which is the imbalance in good to bad flora, we're going to look at that in a little more detail in just a sec. You end up with digestive issues. In other words, you're not actually breaking down and absorbing your food properly. So all that money that you're spending on organic food, I know we we buy almost exclusively organic food whenever we can. And the grass-fed, grass-finished, and all that stuff. We're spending a lot of money on food, but it may not be actually getting absorbed properly. Remember, you need your vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, uh, antioxidants, trace elements, phytonutrients. All that's required for good health. So here we see because of stress, the body breaking down, fight, flight, sex hormone imbalances, and then secretory IgA, which is what? It's basically your immune system, and you'll end up with worse than dysbiosis, overgrowth, and increased food sensitivities. Now you start wondering, what the heck should I be eating? And you've got liver congestion, detoxification, possibly. That's where the demand for more cortisol comes in, which exacerbates this vicious cycle. You've got out inflammation, possibly autoimmune. This is the beginning of stress, what we call stress-induced hyperpermeability cycle. Let me tell you a very, very interesting fact that I don't know I ever shared, even with my staff. And I was just reminded of it this morning. I was doing a little background study. And when I started in this health space, leaky gut was considered a myth by standard medicine. Can you imagine that? That leaky gut, this thing that we are dealing with every single day, was not even considered. And so I'm going to flip forward 
through of these slides. And so these slides are uh, things that I go over in great detail. We really get in the anatomy, the physiology, the biochemistry of how this breakdown occurs, where can it occur and how does it occur, and what things might appear. People in the public is suffering with all of this stuff and a whole lot more. These are just the diseases in secretory IgA deficiency, and it's not even all of them. And what we like to say in our in our methodology is that all of these are not the problem. They're the results of and contributors to the problem. Metabolic chaos. That's an expression that I explain on these Saturday calls. And if you want to know more, come come to some more Saturday calls with us. There's another lesson. This is worth spending a couple minutes on. And now you're going to start to see where, where Jason comes in. Because what affects this person, uh, intestinal permeability, elevated stress, toxic, and antigen burden, you might just summarize that way, which leads to systemic disease. But it's poor dietary choices. It's how we live that matters. It's stress and emotions, toxic exposure like mold, infections like, oh, name a few. Lectins, also from food. These are pretty easy to... Uh, identified, by the way, you don't even need to run any labs. And that's coming from a guy who teaches a course in lab work. You have a vested interest in lab work, but you don't always need to run labs. Uh, systemic disease, of course, lifestyles, low stomach acid like drugs, certain drugs you might be on, those kind of things. Enzymatic deficiencies, which come, they're sort of part and parcel. I could show you how those occur. Exactly. I can show you right where enzymatic deficiencies occur, like why you get them, how they work, how they affect the body. So these stressors from the outside and starting to get into the inside here, again, back to the mold and toxic overload and dysbiosis and malnutrition, food allergies leads to this. And that's what we're here for. We're here to help people sort out the metabolic chaos. Now I'm just going to go, I think, to one last slide. As you can see here, as I'm going through our course slides, you're going to, you would learn a lot. <laughs> now on to another um, lesson even, and measuring, measuring zonulin. And so here's a diagram of a healthy gut environment and an unhealthy gut environment where who knows what caused it. It could be antibiotics, poor diet, lousy hygiene, all kinds of pollutants, viruses, molds and other things. So in the gut lumen, which is inside the gut, you've got physiological microbiota. You've got commensal, good bacteria. You've got pathopions, bad bacteria. And everybody has some. And a lot of it sort of lives in this mucus layer. We call it the mucosal barrier. This is really a critical functioning, living, breathing um, mixture. And it's there to keep us healthy. And if that isn't healthy, you won't be healthy. Now, the next layer is the epithelial layer. That's a single cell layer that coats all the villi and all the intestines. And then we have what's called the lamina propria, which is inside that. So this is basically looking at uh, a sectional of the wall of the small intestine. You got inside where the food and everything is, comes down the pipes. Then you got that mucosal barrier that's lining the epithelial cells and then you've got inside that, which, um, you know, there's lots of things to support the mucosal barrier. The mucosal barrier is where a lot of the immune system is, but a whole lot more is just below that. All of these types of uh, cells and regulatory cells, they're there to support health and to prevent disease from taking over. And there's always some activity going on. What I, what I like to uh, say and and tell people and what I think they find interesting. Look, wh why is the bad bacteria there? Why is that part of normal, healthy gut environment? Why would you have bad bacteria? Well, be, you want to keep the, <laughs> the immune system, these guys, hovering. If they go to sleep, <laughs> you could lose a lot of health in the meantime while they wake up. So we keep them awake. We keep all of these cells here. We won't go into what they are just yet or today, but they you got to keep this whole system awake, hovering. We call it physiological inflammation. It's actually normal to have a little bit. And so I thought that was pretty important to realize that, look, there's always some good and bad. 
if you had a four to one ratio, in other words, uh, you know, 80 to 20, 80% commensal, only 20% pathobiotes, you'd actually be really healthy with 20% bad bacteria. What we call pathobionts. I love that term, pathobiont. And so now in an unhealthy, what happens? You get dysbiosis, more, there's too much of the sort of bad, the pathobionts. You get a decrease in commensal. And by the way, those commensal help you digest food. They do a lot of good. They have their own direct benefits. So you now you've got that lack of uh, digestion and things going on. And what happens is the what happens is the pathobionts screw with the mucosal barrier, which is getting weak. It's weakened because of the their existence. They're overpopulating. And they start screwing with the epithelial barrier. The cells themselves get uh, disrupted, dysfunctional, and they'll creep into the lamina propria. So now you have bad uh, uh, bions in the lamina propria. Now you're starting to invoke humoral response. You're, you're, the, the, all of these get activated, but also even, even as it goes into the bloodstream, worse things can happen. And so we call that pathological inflammation, and you probably have some symptoms. Not going to a doctor yet. You don't have irritable bowel or you know Crohn's disease or um, you know infectious uh, inflammation and things like that yet. So we're trying to catch things very, very, very early here. People come to us, and very often they've been told by the physician nothing's wrong with you. They can't measure it on a blood test yet. So we're by, by using our test, which includes zonulin. Zonulin, it's an easy to do finger stick test. We use this uh, to measure permeability changes and damage to tight junctions. Let me go back for a sec and just, because uh, um, you know, those of us that know this stuff, we just kind of skip over it sometimes. For those who don't know, when you get this damage ongoing, this pathological inflammation occurring, that's what zonulin is there for. Its job is to open up the tight junctures, the spaces between these epithelial cells, and flush it out. Zonulin is coming in. I have lots of other uh, graphics to show you how it's flushing out. Now, obviously, if you're flushing out, flushing out, flushing out, by opening the tight junctures, well, new stuff can sneak in. It gets kind of, well, we call it a dysfunctional mucosal barrier. So when you get dysfunctional, it's very easy to spot. Not just your symptoms. Your symptoms aren't the problem. Your gas, heartburn, indigestion, bloating. And what will get worse if you don't do something, it will get worse. Uh, I could, boy, I could go off on some tangents here, um, telling you what worse is like. <laughs> but... Our primary screen would include blood spot zonulin family of peptides, FP. No, so it's not just zonulin. There's a whole family of peptides or proteins that we look at, and it's a, one of our primary screenings. Now, the, the other part of it that we would do with the same blood spot, what, what that means is a finger stick. Easy to do at home and cheap. Easy to do at home and cheap. And you can get it from any FDN. And so, and I've trained uh, 4,000 people, so it's available. So the other thing on the same blood spot test is your histamine and your diamine oxidase. Diamine oxidase itself is a functional measurement. If I went back up here and showed you that, uh, I, and I wanted to show you on paper why you feel crappy when someone else said, oh, here, just take this, just take this uh, chill pill. <laughs> Or take some anti, you know, digest some some digestive support. You know, just sell you some supplements. No, I want to know what's going on between these villi here. Well, uh, you'd see it on another diagram. What's going on between those villi is it's called crypt hyperplasia, and you would see diamine oxidase, a natural enzyme that counters histamine, is absent. Is histamine being broken down? Histamine is what makes you feel crappy. If your DA is low, you have permeability changes. If histamine is high, uh, there's things to look into. 
But th these tests together, these three tests together form an amazing mucosal barrier assessment. So I, this one, I would need more time than we have today. Basically, it's a little bit more about the chemistry, biochemistry, it would be called anatomy, the physiology of uh, intestinal inflammation. And uh, here's a little thing. Take a screenshot of this if you, if you want, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jason. But I just giving you a little bit of quick background so you understand there's a real, real interesting, fun science to this that's uh, uh, looking at the markers that tell you what's really going on, what's wrong. I love this part here, that zonulin also plays a role in permeability changes in the brain, not just the gut. So this is why you feel like brain fog and sad and you, you can't get it going. It's because um, uh, the zonulin acts as a gatekeeper there as well, not just in the intestine. This is clearly in evidence when there's an intake of foods containing alpha-gliadin, for instance. Like me, if I eat gluten, which is the, the protein in gluten is alpha-gliadin, and there's similar proteins, there's lots of cross-reactivity potential, it puts me to sleep. I get drowsy. Man, I, I eat a peanut butter on wheat on gluten-free toast, and it's I still pass out because of the uh, cross reactivities things. What is that happening in my gut? No, it's happening in the brain, and it's just really, really, really interesting. I think I'm going to stop there, having excited you just enough. Uh, we call it titillation uh, for in, in for the inquiring minds. There's lots, lots more, and uh, with that, I, I want Jason as he goes through his presentation to reflect back a little bit, like, well, when Reed said this and Reed said that, he wasn't full of shit, you know? And that's all I care about is not being full of shit. I hope Jason was paying attention to that. <laughs> yeah, we hope he, hope he wasn't just playing pre-sale, waiting for me to be done with my my ongoing on and on and on stuff. Love all, all right. the geeky science So back to you, morning. K. Marie, as the host. I will mute. I love all the geeky science this morning. I mean, that is the heart of FDN right there, y'all. The Just read his humor and what he does at the core. So I hope you were able to learn a little bit of something. But now I'm super excited to have Jason Earl. Is it Jason Early or Jason Earl? Let's just solve this right now. You're on mute, my friend. Screens. Too many screens. Too many screens. Uh, Jason Early. Uh, okay, that's what I thought. No, Jason, Jason Earl. Earl. No, it's Jason Earl. But just okay. <laughs> you can call me early. Just don't call me late for dinner. You know. All right. See another dad joke. Well, that takes me to your bio, which starts off with Jason being an adoring father of two boys in diapers, which we've laughed several times about, haven't we, Jason? He's an amazing entrepreneur and an indoor air quality crusader. He is the founder and CEO of Got Mold and the creator of Got Mold Test Kit. He has become quite the friend of FDN uh, and just a joy and pleasure to talk to. The realization that his moldy childhood home was the underlying cause of his extreme allergies and asthma led him into a healthy home business in 2002, leaving behind a successful career on Wall Street. Over the last two decades, Jason has personally performed countless silk, sick building investigations, solving many medical mysteries along the way and helping thousands of families recover their health and peace of mind. He's been featured and appeared on Good Morning America, Extreme Makeover, Home Edition, The Dr. Oz Show, Entrepreneur Wired, and so much more. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Jason. You take it from here, my friend. It is a pleasure to be here. Can everybody see my screen? You bet. Okay. Good day. Good. Yes. Yeah, good day. I hope everyone is feeling bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Thanks for the for the generous uh, introduction, Kim Marie, and uh, and I also want to thank uh, Reed and the rest of his amazing team at FDN for helping to make this possible. It's a pleasure and a privilege to present today. Um, I think I was introduced as an incredible entrepreneur. It's more like an incurable uh, entrepreneur. Uh, that's it's it's a. Uh, it's another one of those uh, genetic diseases that comes along with uh, bad bad dad jokes. So, um, but the uh, the reason that I'm here today is to uh, discuss the dreaded mold. As Kim Marie mentioned, I'm Jason Earl, I'm the founder and CEO of Got Mold. Um, and so many of you here are providers or uh, in training. So mold's an important subject since it affects so many of your clients. But we all live in buildings and breathe air. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it, this is really practical stuff for all of us. And many of you will uh, face a mold problem or maybe, maybe maybe you're in the middle of one right now. Uh, so I hope to have you leave here a little bit more well-prepared if the subject comes up, which inevitably it will. But it is a scary subject. It can cause a lot of harm. It's expensive to detect and to remediate. Uh, it impacts property value, and it can be very challenging to heal from mold-related illness. But there's really a lot of confusion here. So uh, that's some of the, that's probably the, the primary point here. That's what I'm trying to dispel. And I should warn you that I speak rather quickly, if you didn't notice already. So don't worry about taking notes unless you feel so compelled, because at the end, I'll give you a link to a page where you'll find all of my key talking points, uh, links to the studies I reference, books I quote, a suggested reading list, and some other resources for those of you who really like to dig in. So I know uh, some of you know a lot about mold and some of you know very little, so I'll try to strike a balance here. Some of the things I say, in fact, many of the things I say uh, will challenge what you've been taught and come to believe when it comes to this subject. So I ask that you maintain an open mind. Uh, this is really an emerging field and uh, much of what happens at the research level doesn't make it down to the clinical level or to the consumer for that matter. Uh, and that's something that we endeavor to, to uh, help with talks like this. So what will we talk about? Uh, first, I'll share my story. Uh, about how and why I got into the mold business. Uh, then I'll share some concepts around indoor air that I think you'll find useful. Uh, then we'll uh, learn what the science has shown us about mold's impact on our health and society. Uh, we'll debunk a number of common myths along the way, especially around mycotoxins. Uh, and then we'll talk briefly about testing and remediation, uh, what to avoid there, as well as some important points about detoxing. And then we'll also talk about how to enhance your client intake process to include the conditions in the home environment which should help improve outcomes, leading to longer client engagements, bigger impact, uh, more word of mouth, and a more satisfying, profitable practice. Uh, finally, I'll tell you a little bit about the Gommel test kit, if we have some time, and then my favorite part, which is a Q&A. So how does that sound? Sound good? All right. So uh, a few questions. And so please do uh, jump into the chat for this. Uh, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. You can just answer with one word or two words. Uh, but uh, how many of you cons are concerned about mold and air quality in your home? I'm going to be watching the chats here. So you can say, you know, my home or how about your client's home uh, in contrast, or maybe both. Uh, how many of you are doing mycotoxin urine panels? So we got some ERMI, ERMI stuff popping up already. How many of you are recommending ERMI or doing uh, or have done ERMIs? Got some good uh, good feedback here. How many of you are confused about the results? Just write confused. And how many of you are uh, have clients, uh, or you know, for yourself that matter, that seem to be doing everything right but aren't getting better? And just write not getting better. And then, for those of you who are our practitioners, how many of you are inquiring about? environmental conditions in the home or work environment as part of your initial intake process. And you can just say uh, say yes to intake or no to intake. Yes to intake, good, good. I like to see that. Okay, cool. All right, so I, like I said, I've got a lot of content to cover, so I speak very quickly. Uh, and what we're gonna do at the end, again, I'm gonna give you a link to everything. So if you feel like I'm going too fast, just be patient at the end, you'll get all my notes. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for, for Q&A. Okay, so here's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm what I sometimes call an accidental expert, but I, you know, I even hesitate to call myself an expert these days because it is such an emerging field, like I mentioned a moment ago. Things are constantly changing. There's really new, interesting research popping up every day. So I would say really more I'm a perpetual student in this space. Um, and, and, and that's actually one of the struggles with this is that so many of the practitioners out there kind of get trained and then they just hold on to what they've learned and they're not really open to new ideas. So that's, that's a, that's a fatal flaw in this space because it really, truly is constantly emerging. So I've been focused on solving mold and moisture problems, mold and indoor air quality problems in homes for about two decades now, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, now, of course, a lot of people ask me how and why I got into the business. When I was about four years old, I lost a lot of weight in a three week period and was having trouble breathing. So uh, the initial diagnosis was cystic fibrosis, which was devastating to my parents, especially to my father, who had lost uh, four of his cousins to CF before the age of 14. And it was really a death sentence back then. But a second weekend, a second opinion six weeks later uh, gave them some relief. I actually had asthma compounded by pneumonia, and I tested positive for every single thing uh, that they tested me for in terms of allergies. So it was grass, wheat, corn, eggs, dogs, cats, even cotton. So my, I grew up itchy uh, just with my clothes. 
Um, and I was living on a little farm in central New Jersey, surrounded by it all. When I was 12, my folks split up and I moved out of that moldy farmhouse and all of my symptoms went away. Uh, it was chalked up to what they call spontaneous adolescent remission, which is a fancy term for we have no idea what the hell happened. Um, and it was, you know, it was basically the same story as my grandfather who grew out of his asthma, uh, but I wouldn't think about it again for over a decade. But within two years, my life had turned upside down. My mom died suddenly when I was 14 uh, by suicide, which is actually relevant to this talk. A year later, I was diagnosed with Lyme, which many of you know, seems to disproportionately affect those that are sensitive to mold. So I missed a lot of school and I was forced to drop out and I began full-time hours at the gas station, which is usually where these stories end. But the gas station in my town was next to the train station. And one day I repaired a guy's flat tire and we sparked up a conversation that led him to recruit me as a stockbroker trainee. And within days, I was working next to him on Wall Street. And within a year, I had my stockbroker's license at 17, uh, about a year before I would have graduated. And this unknowingly made me the youngest stockbroker in history, resu resulting in a Guinness World Record, which I held until recently. Not exactly a linear career path. Um, but after nine years, I'd become disenchanted and decided to do something meaningful with my life. So I decided to quit and travel. And while I was away, I came across a story about a man who'd gotten sick in this very hotel, uh, the Hilton Clea Tower, uh, and he blamed the mold in the hotel, which, by the way, is a historic mold problem. If you look back, it was a $50 million mold remediation project uh, by the time the dust settled and the smoke cleared. Um, and he had developed adult onset asthma and a whole slew of allergies that he had never had before. So it was basically like my life in reverse. So it was like a deja vu moment for me. I couldn't help but wonder if it was mold that had made me sick as a kid. So uh, I remember calling my dad from a payphone and asking him if we think if he thought we had a mold problem. And he just laughed at me. He's like, of course, we had mold. We had mushrooms growing in the basement. Why do you ask? You know, it's just very dismissive, kind of set, typical 70s parent. But that was all I needed to hear. A light bulb went on and suddenly all the pieces of the puzzle came together for me. And I immediately became fascinated, um, not with mold per se, but with the idea that the buildings we live and work in can make you sick. That was a new concept for me. Um, and that has uh, been my obsession for the last 20 years. So I came back to New Jersey uh, armed with a bunch of curiosity and took a job with a basement waterproofing company uh, that was starting to do mold remediation. This is before there were any standards or any, any regulations, certainly before there was licensing. Uh, so I could earn a little while I learned and quickly saw how badly the consumer was being taken advantage of. Many times these contractors left properties worse than they, they started using chemicals instead of cleaning and charging outrageous prices. So before long, I started uh, an inspection company that would help consumers navigate this issue, really to protect them from the from the contractors with no financial ties to remediators or conflicts of interest. And early on, we pioneered the use of mold detection dogs, specifically Labrador retrievers. Uh, so with the lab testing in the black labs, uh, we called it lab results. This is a much younger version of me here, 21 years ago. It's kind of hard to believe also. Um, we got a lot of support from the press, which led to thousands of inspections. Uh, without any advertising, mostly referrals from frustrated doctors. Um, and for me, it was really an education by immersion, uh, trial by fire, if you will. And much of the education actually came from Oreo. Uh, she taught me more than I could have ever taught her, especially when it comes to where mold hides in buildings. Um, she showed me uh, where she, I would never even looked or imagined some of the places that we found hidden mold growth. And that company became 1-800-GOT-MOLD. But it always bothered me that the people who needed us most couldn't afford us, and my own parents would not have been able to afford an inspection through us. And I created this company to really help families avoid going through what we did. So, you know, I mean, for me, th this is this is a, a, a seriously important quote. According to the World, World Health Organization, healthy indoor air is a basic human right. And I agree with this wholeheartedly. I mean, healthy indoor air should never be a cost issue. So uh, I put together a dream team of scientists and engineers to create a solution for everyone, something my folks could have afforded. Uh, professional quality at-home air test kit, which we launched last year, and we'll talk more about at the end. But our mission really revolves around education because the biggest impediment, as I said earlier, to healing is misunderstanding and confusion, which is really why we're here today. So shall we jump in? This is my wife, by the way, and she hates this picture, so I can't help but put it in the presentation. So the late great author and philosopher, David Foster Wallace delivered a rather famous commencement address known as This is Water, in which he tells a story about two young fish swimming along, and they happen to pass an older fish who says, morning, boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on, and a few minutes later, one looks at the other and says, what the hell's water? See, of the four basic human needs, air, water, food, and shelter, the one we think about last is air, but air is our water. And the irony is that air is the one thing we can live without for the shortest period of time, yet air is often an afterthought. So on that note, let's take a conscious, deep breath together, all of us. Ready? 
all 88 of us. Now, you do that, adults breathe about 13 to 15 times a minute, which comes out to over 20,000 times a day. So I want you to think about that as 20,000 doses. And they're not insignificant. In aggregate, that's about 2,000 gallons a day, which is enough to fill a swimming pool. Okay, and ready for this? 30 pounds of air. And I've done the math on this. I've even done it with my four-year-old where we've weighed balloons and done the math. It's, it's about 28 pounds of air, if you can get your mind around that. So you literally consume more air than you do water and food combined by weight and volume every single day. And again, this is an afterthought. And look, we spend most of our time indoors rebreathing the same air 20,000 times a day. Indoor air is your single largest environmental exposure. And it's one area where we have enormous potential for control if you choose to exercise it. But unfortunately, we rarely do. So into mold. So how does mold affect us? Well, according to the Mayo Clinic, almost all cases of chronic sinusitis are mold related, affecting about 37 million Americans, which makes it the most prevalent long-term respiratory illness in America. And according to EPA and Berkeley Labs, about a quarter of all asthma cases are mold and dampness related. And this number's on the rise. In the last 20 years in the United States, allergies have increased by 50% and asthma has increased by a third, epidemic proportions. In 2008, Brown University did a major study with over 6,000 participants, and they found a strong relationship between mold and dampness indoors and depression. Now, naturally, this caught my attention. Was this what led, at least in part, to my mother's troubles? We'll talk more about this a bit later. So what does mold do to us? Well, it affects everyone differently. It really is about individual sensitivity and pre-existing conditions, but even the toughest of the bunch will be affected given enough exposure. Now, the primary effects are allergies, inflammation, and toxicity, and much less commonly fungal infections, which can be deadly, especially for those with a compromised immune system. But many people experience allergies, inflammation, and toxicity all at the same time. Now, there's also a fight or flight adrenal type response in highly sensitive people, which can lead to emotional dysregulation and a, a vicious cycle of fear and suffering. Now, it appears that this is inflammation-based, but the science is still emerging. Now, some of the most interesting research along these lines is pointing to the trigeminal nerve in the face, which works as an environmental sensor. It's known as the third chemical sense behind taste and smell. So it picks up, picks up touch, heat, cold, and pain, but the nerve endings detect toxins like airborne chemicals known as VOCs or volatile organic compounds, which cause it to be irritated. Now, this irritation can lead to a wide array of symptoms, uh, an inflammatory response, including cytokines, uh, and this may answer many of the mysteries around how mold exposure, even in small amounts, can lead to a disproportionate reaction. So in other words, it's not a dose response relationship. It's not like you get hit with a lot of it and you have a big response. Uh, the nerve can become sensitized, which often comes from a major or chronic exposure. Uh, but in other words, people can have symptoms of toxicity, but it's actually a hypersensitivity and system of the ner a symptom of the nerve being irritated. So here's a diagram of the three branches of the nerve they, 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 the nerve endings are in the eyes, cheek, and jaw with a high-speed line to the brain. So here are some common symptoms and associated ailments. I'll let you peruse. Uh, I apologize for the small type. You can also find this on our website. Note that the top section contains uh, symptoms associated with short-term exposure, which usually resolve quickly when you leave the environment or remediate. The second is much deeper, and these symptoms can stay with us for a long time, even after exposure is over. Um, one of the most common things we see not listed here is chemical sensitivities, actually, um, which is really interesting. So people can develop chemical sensitivities due to a, a large chemical exposure, which, by the way, may mean just living in a new home. Uh, and then they develop a mold sensitivity because of the chemical uh, chemicals that molds emit, which I'll talk about more later. Um, the same thing can also go in the other direction, where a large mold exposure can suddenly create chemical sensitivities, where those people can no longer go into the grocery store or or the dry cleaner or the or the hardware store. So, um, so it's it's fascinating how the body uh, uh, basically uh, associates these things together. Um, and the last group is where you have overlapping issues with the immune system that exacerbate other illnesses. So we're talking about you know typical chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which probably most people here are familiar with, uh, uh, Lyme disease, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. Basically, it brings these latent symptom profiles to the surface. So the bottom line is that short-term exposure tends to lead to short-term symptoms, and chronic exposure tends to lead to, to chronic symptoms.
Now, I often say that the immune system is like an amazing juggler. It can keep thousands of processes going with such elegance and mastery. And mold is like a guy across the room throwing baseballs at him. So he's going to have to make a decision here, right? Am I going to keep juggling or protect myself from this onslaught, uh, this evolutionary threat? And that's what mold does. It interrupts lots of biological and metabolic processes. Uh, it's the great interrupter and, and lots of balls get dropped in the process. And put simply, mold is, is kryptonite. It makes you weak. It makes you susceptible to other ailments and disease, even if you're Superman. So who's most susceptible? Well, I hate reading slides, but it's the very young, the very old, anyone with a respiratory illness or, or environmental sensitivities. Uh, the MTHFR genetic mutation is very interesting. It's it, uh, it's, uh, it's 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 supposedly it affects about twenty five percent of the population. Uh, although the data on that is is difficult to find. Um, anyone with a compromised immune system is obviously highly at risk. And then the last one is those who spend a concentrated amount of time indoors. Well, I think that's pretty much all of us. Um, you know, these days we barely leave our house. And this is a really interesting point too, you know, evolutionarily speaking, you know, our human species has spent 99.9% .9 of our time outdoors. We've only spent 0.1% of our entire time on this planet indoors like this. And the root word of human uh, comes from humus, which is soil. And we're so disconnected from that. And it's, and it's, it's my strong belief that that's the genesis of, of most of the autoimmune um, allergies, asthma, uh, even cancers that we're experiencing here in epidemic. <laughs> so about half of all U.S. homes uh, have mold and dampness issues. About uh, almost all commercial buildings have had water damage. About half of all commercial buildings have current leaks. And about a third of schools have roof problems. Now, this is from Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Very good data. But I'm here to say that I've been in a lot of schools and every one of them that I've been in uh, for an assessment has had a roof problem. So I think that number might be a little bit low. But through property damage and health effects, uh, mold impacts up to 100 million Americans every year. And some say many more when you consider contaminated food, which we'll talk about. It may very well affect us all. So what is mold? I like to call it nature's great recycler. Its job is to turn dead plant matter back into dirt. It's doing its job when it's working in your yard with leaves and twigs, not so much when it's doing its thing in your living room. So how does it happen? Well, mold requires the following five things to grow. It essentially loves the same conditions we do, except a little more moisture. So it just waits patiently for an imbalance to occur, like a seasonal change, a leak, a flood, uh, or some other source of moisture, and poof, like a combination lock. Once the right conditions are present, it unlocks in a remarkable array of biological processes, and it begins to eat. And it grows anywhere, even space. These images are from the International Space Station. Some can even degrade metal on spacecraft. They're called technophiles. There are even extremophiles, which eat jet fuel, believe it or not, and those that clean up oil spills. But of all the things the mold likes to eat, drywall seems to be at the top of the list. And modern residential construction is one step away from paper mache. You know, so demand from the baby boomers after World War II spurred industry to create faster and cheaper building materials, especially drywall, which is an ideal growth medium for mold. It soaks up water and has paper on both sides for the mold to nosh on. And there's really no better food for mold food to build buildings out of. So we went from building to last with stone, brick, plaster, old growth timber, and things like that that were chemically inert, uh, that, that, that did not support fungal growth. Uh, we also built buildings that had a lot of natural ventilation. Um, but we went from building to last with these really wonderful materials uh, to, being, uh, to building for, for, for profit and speed. And what that also meant is that we build homes that are now highly susceptible to mold growth, uh, simply because of the cheap absorbent build, building materials we now use. And what's interesting is in 2017, researcher Bridget Anderson demonstrated that all the drywall she tested, all the drywall she tested was pre-contaminated with the most aggressive molds associated with chronic water damage. So our most popular building material comes pre-inoculated with stachybotrys and catomium spores, among others. No, my mentor before this research, he used to say that we build self-composting homes, just add water, and he couldn't have, have been more, more true. It couldn't have been more true. So for all of the advancements in technology over the last 200 years, we've backslid badly with our buildings. I mean, even the dumbest of the three little pigs didn't build this house out of paper, uh, but we do at scale. Now, since our buildings are so mold friendly, it all comes down to this. Mold control is moisture control. I'm going to say that several times throughout the presentation. Mold control is moisture control. It's that simple. People complicate this to the nth degree. And you have to act quickly when you have a leak, flood, or humidity issue. You only have 24 to 48 hours before mold starts to grow. See, with water damage, it can be free or cheap. 
Sometimes you can tear out the wet stuff yourself, assuming no pre-existing mold. Insurance will cover it, uh, and you don't need the guys in moon suits. But at the 72-hour mark, things get crazy. Insurance doesn't cover most mold, and when it does, only a small amount. So it's cash pay. And a perfectly executed mold remediation done according to industry standard can take a month, including testing and inspections. So it can be very disruptive. People often have to move out. So I encourage you to think and act in hours, not in days when it comes to this. So let's dig in a little more. So what happens when mold grows? You've got essentially three buckets. Now this is hyper reduced for simplicity, but essentially we have these three large buckets, spores, mycotoxins, and microbial VOCs. Now spores are the hardy reproductive capsules. These typically trigger allergic and upper respiratory complaints, but can also carry mycotoxins. If you inhale right now, you're breathing in hundreds, potentially even thousands, likely without any ill effect. So they're a normal part of a healthy environment. In fact, the more diverse, the better, but like most things in moderation. So the dose makes the poison. Small amounts are actually hormetic and actually train our immune system. So what's normal in nature. But again, we've disconnected ourselves from nature, which explains a lot of the hyperreactivity. Large amounts can cause symptoms though. And that's why mold growth indoors is a problem. They build up and concentrate and we rebreathe them 20,000 times a day. By the way, what you see here is a, uh, a scanning electron microscope image of aspergillus. And so check this out. Fungi, uh, kingdom fungi, including mushrooms, macrofungi, and, mi and microfungi, uh, produces around 50 megatons of spores every year, which is the equivalent of 500,000 blue whales. And to put that in further context, about 25 times as much tea is drank every year uh, by, the, by, by, by all, uh, all people. So uh, it's the largest producer of biological particulate on the planet. Um, it even impacts weather systems, formation of water droplets and uh, and ice crystals to form snow. I mean, we find spores 13.7 miles above the Earth's surface by weather balloons. So we are awash in spores. They are unavoidable. But mycotoxins are the ones that get all the headlines. Um, and what are they? Well, very specific, very, very uh, uh, simply, they are the chemicals produced by some molds during active growth, really to inhibit competition. So only a small number of molds, by the way, roughly about 100 species produce these toxins. And even those molds only produce them intermittently uh, and when they're threatened by competition, for example. They're like chemical weapons on a microscopic level. So what you see here is penicillin, penicillium, um, and it was the way, uh, it, it, this is penicillium growing in a dish with streptococcus. Uh, the little moat you see here is uh, uh, mycotoxins oozing out from the side to inhibit the growth of the streptococcus. So this is how antibiotics, specifically penicillin, uh, was discovered by Alexander Fleming. He first called this uh, mold juice. I can almost hear him saying that in the Scottish brogue. You can learn a lot about mycotoxins by just looking at this photo. So contrary to popular opinion, they are not spraying out. Um, these are rather sticky substances uh, that, are, that, that, are, that adhere to the surface to inhibit surface growth. Mold wants to protect what it's eating. So if they were spraying out, the whole dish would be clear. Okay, do you see what I mean by that? You guys follow me on that? So unfortunately, there's a tremendous amount of con confusion around these chemicals. They're blamed for most mold-related illness, yet the data does not support this, nor does my experience. Meanwhile, millions of people are treated for mold sickness using tools that focus exclusively on mycotoxins. Many tear their homes to shreds and go broke looking for mold problems that may not exist, mostly driven by a mycotoxin urine test and an ERMI, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But lastly, of the three buckets, we've got MVOCs. And this is where there's a lot of really interesting emerging research. These are microbial volatile organic compounds, also known as the musty smell. Now you're probably familiar with man-made VOCs. Well, microbes make them too. So when mold digests what it's growing on, it releases gases just like we do. Incidentally, they're not really our gases. Uh, they're actually microbial gases. Well, I guess I've got a visitor here. It produces a potpourri of industrial solvents, alcohols, ketones, and aldehydes, even carcinogens like benzene and toluene. Common symptoms include headaches, nausea, dizziness, and fatigue, uh, as well as difficulty concentrating. Researchers show that they can have a lasting impact too. In this 2005 study, they followed 2,500 preschool kids for six years and found the kids in musty homes had double the risk of developing asthma. In fact, it's the second leading predictor of childhood asthma behind maternal smoking. So what used to be considered sort of an aesthetic nuisance, just that grandma basement smell, is now recognized as a health hazard, which I'll elaborate upon more here. So now this is Dr. Joan Bennett, a good friend and very well-recognized mycotoxin expert. 
one day after reading about Oreo, my mold dog, she called me and said, I'd like to meet your dog and it's okay if you come too. And so when we went to visit, she told me her story and it changed my life. She was previously a professor at Tulane in New Orleans. And when Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, her house was flooded. And being an ever curious scientist and knowing what to expect, when the waters receded, she went down to investigate the damage, equipped with a backpack full of sampling equipment and uh, an N95 respirator. And before she went in, she put on the respirator, keeping in mind that N95 only takes out particles, doesn't take out gases, to protect against the spores and the mycotoxins she, that they might be carrying. And what she found was what she described as a fungal utopia. But as she walked around, heartbroken, taking these ironic pictures of moldy mycology books, she noted that the strong, dank smell was coming through the respirator. And within minutes, she began to feel ill. And she had to leave the building several times and had to ultimately uh, curtail her efforts. And this made no sense to her, even being a mold expert. What was it that made her sick? It must have been something in the smell that had seeped through. So she went back to her lab and began to study these little known compounds that comprised the musty odor. And she first isolated a very common MVOC known as the mushroom alcohol. Uh, using special fruit flies that fluoresce when they produce dopamine. It's amazing what you can buy online. She exposed them and she, they, they, lo and behold, stopped producing dopamine. They stopped reproducing. They stopped flying down and, 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 set, and set it to the light, which is their instinctive nature. Um, and so interestingly, right, they've stopped producing dopamine. They stopped uh, reproducing. Remember that Brown University study linking mold and depression? Suddenly things started making more sense to me. Uh, they also developed Parkinsonian-like symptoms is the way she characterized it. She found the compound to be neurotoxic. So now here's a toxic compound produced by all actively growing molds, which easily disperse in air and can penetrate walls, unlike spores and the mycotoxins that they carry, and can cause a major immune responses, sensory nerve irritation, resulting in a wide range of symptoms, but it's not classified as a mycotoxin. So her paper called Silver Linings, which I'll, of course, include in my notes, uh, which was written in memoir style, it's actually quite a good read, it was published in 2017. And this spurred a number of other animal studies showing that the musty smell causes locomotor damage, uh, pro-inflammatory response, respiratory dysfunction, mitochondrial damage, the list is long. So she coined a term based on this, uh, volatoxin, combining volatile and toxin. Uh, and the musty smell is often the first clue of a mold problem. So pay close attention. If you smell it, you probably have it but it's also a major health hazard. It triggers symptoms along the allergic, inflammatory, and toxicity pathways. And it's more than likely that most bolt building related mold induced illness is actually caused by these compounds, not mycotoxins. Unlike mycotoxins, which only some molds produce sometimes, MVOCs are produced by all molds during growth. So mold and microbial growth is a biological factory, which makes industrial solvents, and chemical weapons. This is not hyperbole. So this is a very important point. The whole toxic mold, black mold concept is flawed. We don't need to worry about the species so much. All mold growth of significance indoors has the potential to, to create toxicity, regardless of whether or not it produces mycotoxins. So what's exactly making us sick? Well, nobody knows for sure. The science is still emerging, but my experience over the last 20 years tells me that it's more than mycotoxins and it's also more than mold. We live in chemical boxes made of mold food with little to no air exchange. So pollutants build up and we rebreathe them 20,000 times a day. It's not just one thing, it's cumulative. And the evidence is strong that most mycotoxin exposure is from food, not from air. So building related mold induced illness should be looked at differently than mycotoxin related illness from food and treated accordingly. Although, of course, they often overlap and can amplify one another. So this also explains why so many people don't get better when they change their environment or remediate you often have to make major dietary and lifestyle changes too. But there's a whole segment of microbial growth which isn't often looked at, and they're called actinomycetes. And I saw someone in the chat uh, bring that up. Actinomycetes are soil bacteria that are very similar to fungi uh, in the sense that they create spores, um, and they grow right alongside of fungi and water damaged uh, buildings. They also produce microbial VOCs. And check this out. Most people think that fungi is where we get most antibiotics. Actually, two-thirds of the commercial antibiotics are produced by actinomycetes. So we know that very potent chemical factories. And yet their metabolites and toxins are rarely tested for, uh, but emerging research indicates that we are affected by them. And we're currently working on a dust test that will include these organisms. So speaking of testing, let's talk about mycotoxin testing for the body, which is the most common kind, usually urine panels. And this is another area of major confusion. People often tell me, I've got mold in my body. Probably not. Uh, molds are aerobic and need oxygen to survive. So they don't usually colonize inside us the way people imagine, except in the rare circumstance of 
fungal infections, which tend to occur only in the respiratory tract and mostly uh, affect those with a compromised immune system. What you likely have are the toxins, as most of us do. Not the mold itself. Or they ask if we can test for the mold that makes a certain a mycotoxin, which since it was in their urine, and no, we can't, and you shouldn't waste your time or money looking for a needle in a haystack, mostly because it's probably not coming from your house. Unfortunately, we have two ideas that have mashed up here, airborne mycotoxin exposure in buildings, which is very limited, and food exposure, which is common and nearly ubiquitous. So it's a classic example of conflation, also known as a logical fallacy, where we merge two different ideas that don't actually belong. So here's a great example. All bats are animals, some wooden bats are, are some wooden objects are bats, and therefore some wooden objects are animals. Now, we clearly know that's not true, but there's a similar idea with mold and mycotoxins. Mold grows in buildings, mold makes mycotoxins. I have mycotoxins in my urine, therefore, therefore it must be from mold in my building. Not necessarily. Now, this reminds me of a joke that Ronald Reagan used to tell about a therapist who was asked to treat two young brothers, one for his pessimism and one for being too optimistic. They put the pessimistic kid in a room filled with toys and games, and he did nothing but complain. This toy didn't work. That toy is the wrong color. These games all suck, you know, so on and so forth. Meanwhile, the optimistic kid was smiling and diving into the manure, digging and laughing, totally joyful, having the time of his life. And the therapist couldn't understand what was going on. So he asked the child why he was so happy, and he responded, are you kidding me? With all this horse manure, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. In neuroscience, there's something known as confirmation bias. And this is heavily in play with providers who specialize in mold treatment. When your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And with such limited options for testing, it's easy to see how this came about. But the problem is with these tests is that they're almost always high, regardless of actual conditions. I'm talking about ERMI and the, and the urine panels. So you string together a bunch of tests with high readings paired with misinterpre misinterpretation of the data, and you can create an alarming picture. It's a classic case of garbage in, garbage out. So mycotoxin testing has real value. And I, and, and I believe that these reports are, but I believe these reports are being uh, misinterpreted. And the data is being used incorrectly, often against the consumer, unfortunately. These are legitimately dangerous compounds that we need to be aware of and avoid. But the reality is that we're all exposed to them through our food supply to some degree. So, but be aware that there is an entire industry that has emerged around these tests. And quite frankly, it's mostly unscrupulous inspectors and remediators who leverage the fear that a high mycotoxin urine report creates into extremely expensive inspections and equally outrageous remediation projects, often using ERMI and ERMI derivatives as tests, which are almost always high, further assuring more work. Sometimes these homes are gutted to the bones without ever having found an actual mold or moisture problem of significance, just chasing mycotoxins and stachybotrys spores, even replacing perfectly good and relatively new HVAC systems, which I have never had to do once in 21 years. And the racket is further supported by well-intended but misguided practitioners who refer their patients to these opportunistic inspectors and remediators who then misinform their customers and the daisy chain of misinformation gets echoed on social media. But getting clear on the actual source of these chemicals so that people can get better, uh, so that he can make the necessary dietary and lifestyle changes really, uh, is the only way that they will get better. So we all know that eating moldy food is a bad idea. And it's usually pretty obvious when it's in the fridge or on the produce section in the grocery store. But how do we know if, if it's in our grains, nuts, seeds, spices, peanut butter, packaged goods? Uh, well, we don't, but actually we do. And many of us don't wanna know, but what we don't know can hurt us. And as much as we have a problem with our buildings, it turns out we likely have as big of a problem with our food supply. And what's worse, it can't be remediated and it's hard to avoid, especially when we dine out. So back in 1985, the UN, estimated global food crop contamination with mycotoxins to be around 25%. And a group of food scientists went to investigate further in 2018. They found the number was lower in local areas, but exported food ended up at the port of destination, like here, with 60 to 80% contaminated. And so while a no sugar, no grains diet will get you part of the way, it turns out that even keto can do you wrong if you're not eating organic, grass-fed, pastured meats, like Reed was saying, ideally local. One source of contamination is spices, which are often sourced in developing countries and poorly cured and stored, but also something known as carryover effect from animals eating moldy feed, right? So livestock are often fed grains, especially the conventional ones, that they don't eat in nature and that don't meet human standards. And yet the meat is still fed to humans and it rolls up the food, food chain just like mercury does with fish, right? So these things are cumulative. This is very important. And many foods tested for mycotoxins are below the odor threshold 
uh, or below the uh, th the uh, below the threshold for the for testing, but still positive. So one meal may exceed the acceptable level, but in aggregate. And so here's the problem: you can't cook them out, and there's really no way to destroy them. And they don't excrete easily since they're most are not water soluble, and they lodge in our fat cells. So as you probably know, uh, most grains are huge with mycos, especially corn products, wheat, rice, quinoa, soybeans, cereal grains, et cetera, especially imports. Think about the food storage and handling in developing countries, and then put it on a shipping container without climate control for 30 days. So what to do? Well, brace yourself. I know it's hard, but this is the world we live in. If you must eat grains, and my kids do, try to source domestically. Uh, globalization brought a lot of convenience, but also some serious unintended consequences. And a major source of, of uh, hidden exposure comes from our restaurants. You know, food costs drive procurement of, of uh, cheap grains and meats, uh, many of which are imported and almost all conventional. So it's not just the mycotoxins, and I'm not I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but it's also the pesticides, antibiotics, and who knows what else is out there. So everyone asks me for my detox protocol. Uh, and I always say that the first step in detoxing is to stop toxing. So there's a Latin term known uh, via negativa. Uh, which means improvement through subtraction, which I subscribe to uh, uh, wholesale. Uh, so before you embark on a protocol, I think first about what to remove and what to improve. Uh, the detox industry has exploded, and it's way too easy to just grab a handful of binders or start popping supplements. But my experience has been that uh, these are not universally appropriate and often come with unintended consequences. Many pull things out that you want, along with things that you don't want, leading to further imbalances. Uh, also, many of the supplements used for detox uh, can trigger other sensitivities. So, so glutathione, for example, is not well tolerated by those with sulfur sensitivities, uh, and many with the uh, MTHFR mutation fall into that category. So my general suggestion is to start with diet, lifestyle, and environmental improvements, uh, and listen to your body. Some people need professional care to move things through, and this should be done carefully and patiently, and only after you've made noteworthy adjustments. Otherwise, there's really no point. It's kind of like mopping up the water when you haven't turned off the faucet. So... Uh, do things that are universally good, like love your liver, sweat, drink purest water, think good thoughts, and try to avoid fear above all. See, mold is a big and important part of our world. To be afraid of it is to be afraid is, is akin to being afraid of uh, air or or water or gravity. Uh, this is really no way to live. My experience has been the people who get better are the ones who make peace with this, um, and you know, some very interesting research shows that uh, that anxiety actually amplifies the reactivity of the trigeminal nerve, which I mentioned earlier. So the people who stay in fear and make mold the enemy don't usually recover well or at all. And I believe that fear is really more toxic than mycotoxins because it affects every system of the body, whereas mycotoxins are much more targeted. So the most powerful healing detox you can do is an emotional detox. Um, embrace reality, lose the fear. It's the real enemy here. It, it really is about learning to be more discerning and less emotional about this matter. Everything gets better that way. So how have I seen people get better? Well, it's three things. It's air, food, and attitude. Um, get the home environment straight. That's mold, VOCs, healthy home microbiome, which we really don't have time to, to cover in depth today. Uh, number two is get rid of the processed food. And I, I know that seems obvious, um, but you know, especially the conventional meats and dairy, which slip right in, especially when we're dining out, like I mentioned. And, uh, and then with attitude, the people who do the best see this struggle as part of their journey, not a catastrophe. The best cases see this as a path to new awareness uh, that they would never have been able to acquire any other way. And, and many use this experience to help others. And, you know, I, I, I'm in that camp. So if you leave one out, though, air, food or attitude, the chances of real recovery drop off precipitously. Now, of course, this is not a peer reviewed study. Uh, it's purely my experience, but it's been over 21 years with thousands of cases. So even after getting everything clean in their diet environment, some people still struggle with struggle with hypersensitivity, which can really drain your spirits. They often benefit from neural retraining and a support community. Here are four programs that help people uh, who become sensitized and have a hard time moving through the world in a normal way. Um, it, it, it involves adjusting mindset and selectively and gently exposing yourself to things that are perceived threats. So it's kind of like allergy shots for the mind and nervous system. You slowly learn that it will be okay. And a big part of it is community support that they provide. This kind of illness uh, can be very, very isolating, as many of you know. But not everyone gets completely free, um, you know, in the interest of full disclosure. And it does take work, but it's a well-traveled path, and I've seen a lot of successes. Okay, so there's been a water event. We're going to talk about testing a little bit. Maybe someone isn't feeling well, uh, but it seems to get better when you leave the house. Maybe uh, you see something that's suspicious. Uh, maybe it's time to to look into some testing and and, uh, and maybe an inspection.
So people always ask me what the best mold test is. And of course, you know, uh, we, we make one, but my first answer is always you. Uh, you are an exquisite integrated array of precision sensors. You just need to engage your senses and learn to trust yourself. If you see something, smell something, or feel something, I suggest you do something. But unfortunately, there is no silver bullet when it comes to testing. It's more like detective work. You have to look for clues in many places. There's no one test for the body or for the building. And this is true for most ailments. For example, what's the best test for cancer? The test for cancer. You know, Is there one test or diagnostic? No, it's, it's no different here, right? So you can miss cancer on a blood test. You can miss it in imaging. You can miss it with a physical exam. It depends where you test, how you test, and what other data points you have. So you have to take everything into consideration. Does the building have a history of leaks and floods? Is there, are there musty odors? If you do air tests, are there high spore counts? Do people have symptoms which improve when they leave the building? Is there high humidity or signs of dampness? Do you see stains, discoloration, blistering pain, water bugs, or visible mold, right? So you have to look at all these things. Now I asked ChatGPT to create an image depicting the importance of multiple data points. And, and this is what it gave me. It's pretty amazing stuff in two seconds. So lab data can be confusing. People often want a simple yes, no answer. Um, they want one test to tell you everything, but that's not how it works. Uh, this is detective work and we're looking for clues. So here's an example. You do some air tests and spore counts look normal, but there's a musty odor, a history of leaks and people having symptoms. Um, so this is not a false negative. It tells you that the mold is likely growing in a wall or a cavity and you need a specialist who knows how to find hidden mold. So a not detected reading is an important data point. It helps you characterize the nature of the mold problem. In contrast, remember what I said about confirmation bias? A false positive can be very dangerous. Tests that show up high all the time can lead to misdiagnoses and wasteful and unnecessary treatments and remediation. Unfortunately, the most common tests like ERMI are prone to false positives, so this is very challenging. You know, important points here. Number one, no single test is uh, actionable by itself. And no DIY test uh, should be used as a substitute for professional testing or inspections when it comes to mold, any more so than you should diagnose yourself with car for cardiac disease based upon a, you know, an at-home cholesterol test or something like that. It requires context. So let's talk about context. What's this? Just an orange circle, right? Does it mean anything Does it mean to you? Doesn't mean anything to me. This is most test data by itself. Until you have context. Here, that empty circle, see, back to this. That empty yellow circle is the sun, the center of our solar system and the source of all life. Far from nothing in this context. The contrast against the other dots of color here uh, or, or the other data points, if you will, give it meaning. Uh, and that's what any indoor air quality investigation is really all about, whether you're doing it yourself or with a professional. Get as many data points as you can so it creates a picture like this one. Now, we often suggest people use our ebook, How to Find Mold, to guide a DIY inspection, which I'll include in the resources at the end. Here's a QR code if you want to grab it now. In the guide, we emphasize that you can't rely on testing alone. You have to look for clues. You have to engage your senses. You have to collect multiple data points. We include inspection checklists, FAQs, uh, tips on how to hire a mold inspector. It's a great people, great place for people who uh, are, are getting started in their mold awareness journey. We get a lot of great feedback on this. And after your initial DIY inspection, a cost-effective follow-up is our air test kit. It uses the same devices as professionals, but without the cost or hassle. And if we have time at the end, we'll tell you more about that. Um, but we made it because we got so many calls from people who couldn't afford a professional inspection and we couldn't find a DIY kit we could recommend. They were all surface tests and what we call junk science, which I'll talk about right now. So I define junk science as scientific tools or principles used in an unscientific way. Unfortunately, when it comes to mold testing, especially on the DIY side, it's the vast majority. Swabs are outdated and and add no value. Same with Petri dish test kits, known in the industry as settling plates or gravity plates. Uh, Petri dishes have use in the lab, very limited these days, but uh, and they used to be used in the field quite a bit before advances in DNA sequencing made them obsolete because they miss most of what's there. Um, they're always positive too, which simply proves that mold spores are ubiquitous in the environment, right? 50 megatons a year. So they only allow for the fastest growing molds to grow too, which is problematic because Many chronic water damage indicators are slow growing and won't even grow on those medium the, the, those those mediums. They'll only grow on on cellulose agar, not not the not the uh, malt extract. They really have no place in a mold assessment. Um, ERMI is a mess and causes lots of fear and confusion and harm. Uh, more on that in a bit. And these instant mold tests are very narrow. They may help you if you aren't sure if what you see is mold or not, but they offer very little value otherwise. Um, in many ways, I look at these tests like science fair experiments. So. Back to ERMI. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, ERMI stands for Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. 
It's a dust-based research tool developed 20 years ago uh, that's been used a lot for mold testing, but it's very problematic. Um, it focuses on 36 species uh, that were actually ascertained from uh, only 32 homes in Ohio, so not exactly a robust geographically diverse data set. Uh, it's 20-year-old DNA technology, um, and I can't think of anything that's accelerated more than, than DNA technology in the last 20 years. Um, they're almost always high, uh, and people often take action on them uh, absent any other data points. Uh, so in, in many cases, this creates a lot of fear and confusion. In fact, our first test kit was an ERMI kit. Uh, and we we discontinued it because of all the all the panic that we saw it create. So I'll include a link to an in-depth article I wrote in the notes at the end. But here's a QR code for it, too, in case you want to grab it. And don't take my word for it. Here's what the EPA has to say. Should I test my home using ERME? It says no. I mean, it's very, very clear. This is a research tool that's being that's been hijacked for, for commercial purposes. And most test, the dust testing is junk science, quite frankly. Uh, presence in dust does not equal exposure any more so than having a pit bull next door equals a dog bite. Um, you know, these things cannot harm you at a distance. Um, and so, you know, you'll have a wide array in all household dust unless you clean very, very fastidiously. However, um, ERMI only looks at 36 species uh, out of the 100,000 known. And I like to think that, that this like a laser beam, using a laser beam to drive down the highway instead of headlights. Uh, there's a new method of analysis called next generation sequencing, which looks for all known microbes. Uh, and this includes the actinomycetes. So uh, we need more data, not less to make sense of the environment. And we're working on a new dust test that includes all of these things. We hope to have it out later next year. So really quickly here on professional testing, what we look to do is gather as much data as we can. We don't look at species. We don't culture. Uh, culturing mold is so 1999. Uh, spore traps are used for air testing, uh, which we use in our kit. They're also really useful for wall cavity samples. And we've solved a lot of mysteries with this stuff. Um, we also love to test for VOCs and MVOCs since we see so many symptoms from them and improvements when they're addressed. Um, as mentioned, we're working with the NGS on some dust testing, uh, which will come out soon. And uh, tape lifts, actually, instead of swabs. Um, you know, we, we like to use tapes because we can actually see if there are spores or actual growth, something that swabs can't do. When you swab a surface, it just, it's only, it can only be cultured. Um, and you can swab any surface and find something. So when do you need a pro? Well, if the visible mold exceeds a few square feet, if you're going to get remediation done, you should always have guidance from a pro. Uh, if there's hidden mold growth and you need an investigation, uh, that's usually a good idea. And also if you have a hard time diagnosing the moisture problem, something like this. This is actually water that was from the, from water, this was from water that was in the ductwork um, on the first floor of the building and it permeated up and it froze on the inside of the attic. So uh, these things can be very tricky. So it's been said that, uh, that your mold inspector or environmental consultant can have a greater impact on your health than your doctor. And I think that's often true. So this is not like hiring a plumber or a roofer. So here are the qualifications, but really in addition to the licensing and certifications, it's really about philosophy. And so you wanna find out, you know, do they do remediation also? That would be a conflict, that's a big no-no. Um, do they advocate the use of chemicals? If so, that's a no-no. Uh, the industry standard is very clear on that. You wanna ask for references and check them and you wanna watch out for fear tactics. Um, anyone who's focused heavily on mycotoxins, uh, or uh, at the exclusion of, of, of dampness. Uh, these are often the same people that are using ERMI. The focus is on detecting moisture problems and the mess that they create. So what's a proper inspection? Well, it should address the whole building. It should take a while. I've spent three hours in a Manhattan one bedroom apartment. So, you know, you, you gotta take your time. We're looking for, for, for details. And an inspection is not just visual or test, just testing. It should include both, especially if there's a health concern. So be prepared to spend a thousand to 1500, but watch out for the guys charging six or $8,000. And this should be the table of contents for a mold report. Anything short of this is no better than a DIY test. The same person should also help you vet contractors, oversee the project, and do the necessary testing at the end, which is why it's so important that they're independent. My average inspection report was 18 pages without any fluff, step by step, exactly what needs to be done. So here are the tools of the trade, and I should also mention integrity in this list. Uh, watch out for inspectors who rely solely on a visual assessment or solely on sampling. And again, these will all be in the notes. And again, here are some things to avoid, and these will be in the notes. So in the interest of time, we'll move through this. So, okay, we have a mold problem. Now, what next? You can do what most people do, but mold does one thing really well. It grows. You can ignore reality, but you can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. So when you're ready to take action, what do you do? Well, so let's talk about remediation. The root word of remediation is remedy. So what are you fixing? Well, you're actually fixing the water problem. First, we fix the water problem. Then we carefully prepare the worksite, remove the mold and affected materials, 
method methodically clean the air and surfaces and notice that there is no treatment. Treatment is just kicking the can down the road. You're either remediating or you're not. And there's no killing, fogging, spraying, painting, sealing. This stuff is absolutely not necessary and you're introducing additional chemicals into the environment. And it's all covered in this document, which is the IICRC S520 mold remediation standard. You wanna make sure anyone you hire is well-versed in this. And you can test them by asking about antimicrobials, by the way, because it's clearly stated in the book that they are not recommended unless there's uh, situations with, where there are concerns around bacteria from sewage or something like that. Now, very important to understand that the stated purpose of remediation as described in the S520 uh, is not to be mold free. It's not even possible really, or desirable. The purpose to is to restore a property to a normal fungal ecology, which really should look a lot like the background fungi in your local area outside, which is why our kit uses an outside sample as a baseline reference sample. And we're currently working on a visual summary of the industry standard for consumer use and training. Here's a little sneak peek. Assuming the water problem is corrected, here's what the initial demo and gross removal should look like. Notice the PPE and containment, and negative air pressure. Uh, they remove all the materials that can't be cleaned, like drywall, carpet, carpet padding, et cetera. And then they clean using HEPA vacuums and damp wipes. No chemicals or sanitizers unless there's concerns about bacteria or sewage. This is how it's not supposed to be done. Note the fogs, paints, and sprays. Why no biocides? Well, very simply, I don't spray anything in my house that I wouldn't spray on my body. And contractors use it as a shortcut, but it also adds an additional step in cost. The mold still needs to be removed. And by the way, also dead mold is still allergenic and potentially toxigenic. So removal is necessary no matter what. Um, and biocides also leave behind a chemical legacy, often an, uh, an odor too, which can leave a building unlivable for people with chemical sensitivities, which is common. Also, many of the chemicals used in remediation are hormone modulators and endocrine disruptors. And then finally, we are microbial. We're comprised of 38 trillion human cells and about 36 trillion microbes. And we're closely related to fungi. So most antifungals actually harm human cells too. Um, and then furthermore, uh, there is strong evidence that a high microbial diversity in the home is correlated with lower cases of asthma, allergies, and autoimmune disease, while lower microbial diversity is linked with much higher cases of asthma, allergies, and autoimmune disease. So we need lots of microbes in our home but just non-growing. So it's all about removal, cleaning, and moisture, moisture control. So prevention quickly is all about keeping things clean and dry. You wanna main maintain a relative humidity between 40 and 60%. Below 40%, you get dried mucous membranes, which is what a lot of us get sick from. It's not the cold, it's the dryness in the winter. Uh, and above 60%, you end up with condensation, dust mites, and mold growth. The ideal target is 45%. So get your humidity gauges and use them. Um, and then moisture management is mostly about regular maintenance, keeping the water from getting in, monitoring humidity indoors and cultivating really a new level of awareness. So use your exhaust vents. Don't dry clothes indoors. You choose, you know, proper materials for places like bathrooms and basements. Um, use your humidity gauges and dehumidify, dehumidify as necessary. Um, and one of my favorite tools, in addition to the humidity gauges, are leak sensors. Put them in places that are out of sight, out of mind. I just had mine alert me to a leak coming from my water softener. So very useful. So wrapping things up here. Uh, here's an important idea for you and your practice if you're, a, if you're a practitioner. Coaching your clients to get their home environment straight will improve outcomes, lead to longer engagements, more word of mouth, and make you more money. But it begins with inquiry. You have to ask the questions and follow up with them. Remember, we breathe 20,000 times a day, mostly in our homes. So nothing you do to optimize diet, exercise, mindset, et cetera, will work long term unless you get their home environment straight or unless they get their home environment straight. So it's like trying to build a beautiful house on a rickety foundation. It's a, it's just a waste of resources. You have to get the foundational elements of health straight, which is air, water, food, and shelter. But air is the single largest environmental exposure and it's also within the shelter. So really we're talking about two of the four. So here are four fast questions you should always ask during your initial intake or when someone presents with a new health challenge. These are mold specific, of course. Are you aware of any mold or moisture problems in your home? Very simple. Is there a history of leaks, water damage, or dampness? Do you feel better when you leave the building? And is there a musty or damp smell? Now, if there's an affirmative answer to any of these, the recommendation would be for further action, either a mold inspection, professional inspection, or a test kit. So remember, test, don't guess. And these will, again, be in my notes at the end. So let me leave you with this thought. Most people think about buildings as these static boxes where we live, work, and store our stuff. More and more, I think about them as an extension of your immune system, like an exoskin or an exoskeleton. Uh, we're a lot like hermit crabs in the sense that we don't do very well without our shell. So your relationship with your home may be the most important one you have in terms of your health and longevity. So take the time to get to know it and make the necessary investments. 
20 years ago, I was captivated by the idea that homes can make you sick. What I've learned is that our homes can also help us heal, but it doesn't happen by accident. It's dependent upon the efforts you make and it impacts every breath you take. Thank you. So before we get into the q and I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Gottmel test kit. Uh, when Oreo and I were getting a lot of national press, we had a lot of people who couldn't afford an inspection uh, who would always uh, who would, would always ask uh, if there was a kit we could recommend, people that were outside of our coverage area, et cetera. So I looked high and low and couldn't find anything but junk science. So we decided to create one. Initially, we created an ERMI kit. And like I mentioned, it was it created just a tremendous amount of angst. Um, so instead, uh, we decided to look at all the other kits and overcome their shortcomings. And this is what we made. So our kits allow you to quickly and easily and affordably sample the air in up to three rooms using the same devices as a professional, but out without the cost or hassle. Uh, it's not to replace a professional inspection, okay? This is very important. It's a cost-effective first step, kind of like a pregnancy test kit in the sense that you wouldn't start buying baby furniture just because it's positive, right? You go to the doctor. So we partnered with the, the world's top lab, Eurofins, for the highest quality results and negotiated really fast turnaround time. So results in three business days, once at the lab, and it's all automated. You never have to chase down your report. Our kits use spore traps, which uh, interface with our BioVac air sampling device, which fully replaces a professional pump. We have the chief inspector at HUD buying these in bulk for his team. Um, and so what you see here on the right is a cross section of the cassette. Uh, air is drawn through so that the spores and other similar sized particulate are trapped, hence the name spore traps. Uh, the analysis identifies all known spore producing fungi. 245 groups covering over 100,000 species. And we're introducing AI analysis, which has raised the bar in a profound way. Now, many of us moldies suffer from cognitive impairment, so we're taking great pains to make this easy, as easy as possible. And that's why we say real science, real simple. The instructions are so easy. My four-year-old could do it. In fact, he has. Uh, and the report has a color-coded interpretation on the cover page, followed by the actual lab data. Uh, what molds were found, what quantities uh, formatted in a way that groups together the common water damage indicator molds. Uh, the last page offers resources for next steps, including how to find qualified inspectors and remediators in your area. Yeah, even our pricing is designed to reduce headaches. Everything's included. So shipping both ways, prepaid return mail or lab fees, the whole thing. Even fresh batteries come with the kits. And you can test your air four times a year, really, for the price of one professional inspection, including testing. Um, you will see that we have one, two, and three room kits, as well as refills. Uh, so once you have a kit, you get to keep the pump. And all you do is buy refills, which are $50 less. So if you're interested in a kit, here's a QR code uh, uh, where you can go straight to, straight to gotmold.com uh, and you use coupon code FDN10 to save 10%. We'll also drop a link in the chat. I see Kim Marie just did that. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in recommending them to your clients, you can learn more about the affiliate opportunity at fdn.gotmold.com. And finally, as promised, for all of you who've been so patiently waiting, here are all my talking points, notes, and references. So I'll leave this up for a minute. But again, uh, let me see here. I can drop this in the chat myself. There we go. Um, and with that, thanks again. Well, thank you. I'm jumping in here first. <laughs> wow, man. Uh, no, it, it was a really good presentation, and and uh, I learned a lot. I mean, sat here fascinated the entire time, and picked up so much, Jason. And I want to thank you for that. And I'm sure I'm thanking you on behalf of the FDNs too who've been watching, and of course you invited some people here. I see some heads nodding. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please uh, turn your camera on and come on. Uh, you can just type it in the Q and A thing there or the chat window. But I'm I'm uh, looking forward to showing Jason how engaging the FDN tribe is and how interested we are in this. Um, you know, there was questions that came along in the chat window, and uh, we'll, we'll ask you a couple. But I'm going to tell you, man, a couple of things. First of all, the funniest thing you said was even the dumbest of the three little pigs didn't <laughs> build his house with paper. That just that had me cracking up so bad. And man, I like funny stuff. I'm not looking for that kind of thing your graphics are wonderful i don't know if you had them custom made if you searched forever for those but gosh you know and they're, they're so graphic illust illustrative net sort of a sort of a thing um and you helped me name my my book that i'm writing 
I, oh yeah what is like it? just as you were speaking you know i'm going to use that one phrase in in my book kind of as a subtitle so that's a secret but, ah, all right but I, but I really appreciate it i just wanted to tell the gang a little bit um i was actually at i was speaking at a conference and uh it was um i think it was keto con and you know i i love to go around and look at all the booths and i'll and, show you hold on and uh most of it's not very helpful you know it's like oh we've seen that before seen that before oh there's there's all the all the beef stick guys you know and then, then i'm walking by this booth and i see jason and he says hey you read davis you know and I, I go what did he just read my sign that's on my chest this big or did he really know me i wasn't sure but um but anyway we we chatted for quite a while i mean he was engaging and you know, smart, no bullshit, just total, like, you know, hey, I'm here to help people, and I've got this technology, and so we got along real well, same ilk, you know, wanting to help, and being very scientific about it, like, I, I can't do anything if it isn't backed up uh, with research, good research, even if I did it myself, you know, like, hey, I've researched this stuff, every slide that I ever made, I, I knew what I was talking about, and could stand behind it from a uh, spiritual and and you know integrity type of way. Jason was like that, I, and I thought, wow, you know, we we got to work together somehow, man. Maybe you could help teach my folks or something like that. I'm not sure, but let's see where it goes. And I'm just going to conclude by saying I used the gut mold test in my house. My wife Raywin, who's on, um, and she just made a comment. This has been one of the best health space on mass. Uh, we've done we've done over 20 episodes, so that's a real compliment coming from a very smart and I might add beautiful lady, uh, Raywin. And so, so um, you know, just thank you for being here, man. And now we'll open it up. Camry, I'll let you take over for Q and A. Thank you, Reed. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree. I think this is one of the best we've had, and I particularly was um, in when you said the fear that that is so much of what is driven in this space when you hear mold equals fear. And if we can just take a breath and just kind of get the information, that was a, a big deal to me. Um, so thank you for addressing that. Um, I'm gonna uh, invite you all for raising your hands if you'd like to come on and ask questions. I see that there are several questions in the chat, but Ruth, you um, raise your hand and I'd like to, so that we can get to a lot of questions, if you can keep your questions fairly short um, and the conversation back and forth fairly short so that we can get to more um, Q&A, that would be awesome. So Ruth. Just just ask your question first. We'll get the story later. If yeah. we do. Don't Thanks. start with your story. Start with the question. Yeah. Go ahead, Ruth. Okay, quick question. I'm curious about your thoughts on air filters. I mean, I have some air doctors, but I, I don't think they do anything for mold. But I keep hearing about high tech or there's a few that I hear about that maybe do. And so curious about your thoughts. Yeah, well, um, so thank you very much for, for your question, Ruth. And actually, I had that in my presentation. But uh, in the interest of time, I had to trim that out. But I knew it was going to come up right away. I didn't expect it to be the first question. <laughs> Uh, so uh, air filters are, uh, I think, a required appliance in every home. Uh, we build these chemical boxes that are airtight and that are very mold friendly. And so they constantly are shedding shedding particles actually from the paint and the floor finishes and things like that. So filters are not just removing airborne particulate that is biological, like mold spores and pollen and things like that, uh, allergens, but they're actually removing a lot of deeply respirable chemical bits that we should be getting out of our house. Uh, that also goes for HEPA filtered vacuum cleaners, very important. Uh, but the key to those is that they have to be true HEPA. Now, what's not true? Well, anything that just says HEPA, but doesn't actually say true HEPA or sealed HEPA, uh, that means that there's a filter in it, but it's not a sealed unit. And that means air can bypass the filter. Uh, and mm. so there's for units, even with Mila, which is this great, you know, high-end brand, they sell a true HEPA and a regular HEPA. <laughs> so, and, and it just requires more oomph. Uh, and so it's a more expensive unit. You'll see that they're always a little pricier. Uh, but on the on the filtration and the air filtration side of things, um, what you want to avoid are um, you know uh, zappers. Quite frankly, uh, you know there 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 are some technologies out there that I, I'm still researching that may uh, allow me to eat my words on the zapper side of things. But really, most of the time, you want something that's going to capture the particles, capture the gases. 
air doctor happens to have a, a, a decent amount of carbon in it. So what you need is with a great air purifier, if you're going to use a traditional filter um, as opposed to a zapper, that you need a really good HEPA or ULPA filter that takes out particles down to 0.1 microns. Okay. And that you'll see them called like HEP, hyper HEPA. There's always like an, like some sort of, um, uh, some sort of uh, descriptor that shows that there's more than HEPA. And you also need to have a lot of carbon. Uh, the carbon is what takes out the gases and the odors, especially microbial gases, as well as the VOCs that emit from personal care products and building materials. Air Doctor has a decent amount of carbon. It's not the it's not the most in the industry. I think the most is IQ Air, um, and uh, you know those units are about a thousand bucks. Jasper dot co J A S P R dot co. Um, th that's a great filter. Um, I have one in my kitchen and it ramps up whenever I'm making bacon because my, my exhaust fan doesn't go to the outside. Yes, I have an ex a bad exhaust fan in, you know, in my own home. Um, so, uh, so I, I really like those a lot. Um, Medify has, has a, a, a decent uh, amount of carbon in it. Uh, not the best, but the large, uh, air doctors will, will do it. The thing is that you got to replace those VOC filters often, uh, because they get saturated very quickly. Awesome. And one other wow. real quick question is about front loading um, washing machines. Uh, yeah. You know what happens? You need to keep them open, never close them all the way when they're not in use. Yeah. And then, and then once they get musty, just replace the boot. That's usually what happens. Okay. And you, you can, you, you know, you can flush them uh, with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, bleach water and stuff like that, which I don't really love, but, uh, but that's a lot of people find, but the boot is what really harbors the, the, uh, the odor usually. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Ruth. Nice Thanks, to see Ruth. you. Good. Yeah, great to see you. When are we going to have another real reunion? Well, we're going <laughs> to have a real one. Uh, it's on the. It's on the. Just sort of on the menu. Maybe okay. back burners, sort of right yeah, now, but it's coming. Dinner at your house, of course. Yep. yep. All right. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for um, putting your hand up and go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for the great presentation. I split my time between the US and Europe, Spain specifically. Does your company provide its services in Europe, Spain? And if not, do you have any recommendations on how to find a, a good testing company in terms of standards or any names? No, uh, I mean, listen, if you look at the if you look at Google as a, a source for data, uh, you'll see that ninety five percent of set searches for mold and mold test kits and mold inspections are from the US. Uh, the awareness uh, overseas mm -hmm. is uh, much lower, largely because there's no service provide there's no community of service providers. So there's not there's no professional inspection companies and professional remediation. Not 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 in abundance. Uh, our test kits we don't advertise them as being available overseas, so you can't buy them on our website that way. But if you email customer service which is help at gotmold.com. Uh, Jay-Z, our, our customer service guru, uh, has made arrangements. We've got people buying them all over the country. You just have to pay for the return shipping on your own. So in other words, you have to arrange for them to get there. You can take them with you or you can ship them yourself um, because otherwise we're, we depend on U.S. Postal Service both ways. And they're prepaid locally and domestically, um, but but internationally, we're not set up for that yet. Got it. So, so quick follow-up question. Uh, how much time between the the time I test and I ship? I mean, how time can how much time can you lapse? Or does it have uh, to sit right away? This, 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 that's what's beautiful about spore traps is that they're actually totally stable. Um, they don't, they don't, uh, it's not a culture based approach. It's a direct mic microscopic analysis. So, uh, so that the time isn't, isn't really, I mean, you want to be, you know, within a reasonable period of time. So the data is relevant um, because the conditions do change on a moment to moment basis through a building. So, you know, if you're looking at data that's three months old, you know, it's probably not rel completely relevant because you're talking about seasonal changes at that point. Um, so my suggestion would be to uh, to to, to uh, grab the samples and ship them uh, as quickly as possible, which is why one of the reasons why we negotiated such fast turnaround times with the lab. Great, thank you, thank you, Stephanie S. Hi, thank you so much. This was awesome. Uh, as someone who has, um, very, I had very Parkinson's like uh, symptoms. I was in a mold sick home and was debilitated um, for several months. Um, I've passed that. I'm trying to, two questions. I'm trying to buy a home in Ohio where there's moisture. Uh, what tips do you have so I can overcome my fear and just live like a normal person? And secondly, um, when I encounter family members that maybe have a musty um, closet, um, I'm trying to give them advice and tips on what to do. Um, and you know, people that 
born in the Midwest, musty closets are there, but I just, I, I can tell something's wrong and I'm struggling with trying to advise uh, other than uh, mold spore testing on how to correct family members' musty closets. Well, you know, this, this, the feeling that comes up when you say that is the serenity prayer. <laughs> Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, because it, unless they're open to it, um, it's a lot. Like when you're talking to people about this kind of stuff, it's like talking about religion or politics or mm -hmm. food for that matter. You tell people their diet's wrong and you, you might as well, you know, just have you get written out of the will, you know. So it's it's a it's a real issue. Um, my my suggestion is that uh, that if you can, uh, you know, if you want to give them a nice uh, Christmas gift, a nice air purifier uh, helps, humidity gauges, you know, give them things that make it real, maybe even a mold test kit and maybe even do it for them, right? Uh, so that they can start to see. Now, one of the test kits, we don't, re we don't, we don't sell it. We have a partnership that we're in the middle of, uh, uh, of inking and it's for a, an MVOC test. So if you email me, jason at gotmold.com, um, anyone, anyone who wants to email me, feel free. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always available, uh, J much to my wife's chagrin. Um, Jason at .com. Uh, I can send you a it's kind of a secret link uh, that you can buy and that will pick up the musty smell as well as man-made VOCs. Mm -hmm. And that makes it real for people, you know, like if it, otherwise, as he said, she said, people become inured to this thing. They, 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 their nose becomes numb very quickly. I mean, the human nose is remarkably powerful, but it gets numb quickly to, to scent, especially if you've been living in it for a while. And again, that musty smell is a, almost a nostalgic thing for some people. It's all, you know, like people, some people actually find it somewhat appealing because of the association to, like I said, grandma's basement, right? Um, so, and I live in the Midwest too. So, so I'm familiar with the syndrome where we lock ourselves in these musty buildings for six months out of the year. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's a real issue. And so I, I, I just think that there's, um, there's a lot you can do, but I would recommend that you not be too attached to outcomes. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, now with buying a home in Akron, Ohio, I've had to back out of multiple deals because they found mold and um, I just don't even want to deal with it. Any recommendations on how to approach that? Yeah. In fact, I'm working on an article about this. Basically, you want to stay away from split levels. Okay. Anytime you've got to build a living space below grade, finished basements are also, uh, they were 80% of my business in, in my inspection business in the Northeast. So finished basements, just eliminate that from the equation. Anytime you walk in and smell new home smell, by the way, uh, that's VOC central. And that is very hard to remediate. It's going to take years to off gas. And uh, this also leads to other sensitivities. And, and when I smell that, I smell autoimmune disease. I smell cancer, honestly. I mean, I, 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 it used to be one of these things where I remember walking into my first apartment. And it was freshly painted. And I was like, oh, I've arrived, you know. And now <laughs> I, I know I know better. So um so yes, we, we went through this too up in Minnesota. We, we looked at 40 houses before we finally found one that didn't have an odor and didn't have obvious building defects. Um, and I have the tools and equipment to be able to check. We have a finished basement, but you want to avoid carpet on slabs, uh, carpet on basements, basement slabs, especially. Um, you want to really tune into exterior maintenance, by the way. If a building hasn't been maintained well inside, guess what? Probably water has been permeating the, the building envelope and that's where hidden mold issues really manifest in the wall assemblies. And so that's tricky because that's not going to show up in, in an air sample typically. Uh, so that's where you have to look. In fact, there's some really interesting uh, work being done um, uh, by, uh, by I'm, I'm not sure I can even mention who, who, who it is, but basically they've come up with a way to be able to, from the, from the curb, be able to assess the risk factor for an asthmatic uh, in that home based upon exterior maintenance. Uh, so really looking for, are the gutters draining properly? Do you see staining? Do you see windows that have gaps around them? You know, so are they properly caulked? Is the ground uh, grade proper, properly uh, shedding water away from the building? Are the gutters dumping six, eight, 10 feet away or into an underground system? And watch out because sometimes it's right against your footing drain, f f a foundation like mine, actually. And I've had to dig them up and, and, and put them where they need to be. So um, so trust your senses. If you see something, smell something, or feel something, right? That's uh, you are the best mold test. Uh, and then find a professional. And, and you know, don't rely on a home inspector. By the way, home inspectors are completely unqualified to do this. 
uh, they're good to tell you how many outlets are not working and what the water temperature is in the hot water heater and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to mold, all they know how to do is grab a sample. They have no idea. And they're actually in many cases prohibited from even saying anything about it in their reports due to the uh, trade association uh, uh, requirements. So uh, it's it's difficult, uh, but you have to just be willing to kiss a lot of toes before you find your your uh, your, your 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 new uh, your new nest. You know, I just mix Thank my you. metaphors. There, but you get the point. Great. I'm going to um, do a couple chat um, questions. What is the difference between mitotoxins referring to mold and mitotoxins in supplements that are recommended, such as mushroom blends offered for health benefits? Okay. So that what you're talking about is actually mycelium uh, in the food supplements. Uh, and that's actually, so that's the fungal structures uh, that form underneath mold and, and, uh, and mushrooms. Uh, and so mycelium I actually, you know, that that's that there's plenty of health benefits to eating mushrooms. And there's there's a lot of confusion around like if you've got a mold sensitivity, you shouldn't be eating mushrooms. And that's actually really not true. Um, now, if you've got a, 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 some sort of an allergic uh, sensitivity to uh, to mushrooms, uh, mold and mushrooms are very, very different. Um, and so many times mushrooms can actually help people uh, going through these uh, through 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 a, through a mold related illness. Um, and mycotoxins are the chemical poisons that are produced by molds specifically. So, oh, there's lots of fungi, but mycotoxins are mold specific. Um, so even mushrooms, which make toxins themselves, they're not called mycotoxins. Uh, mycotoxins are mold only. Awesome. Um, Manaz Manaza, how do I, I'm, you raise your hand, go ahead. I'm sorry if I didn't say your name correctly, but why don't you correct me? Oh no, your mic. Unmute. Unmute. Can you hear me yeah, now? We got you now. There oh, you go. Perfect. Yeah. So thank you so much. Very informative presentation. And we are recently detected with mold. You know, we our doctor recommended ERMI test and we did that. My question right now is uh, I will look into your test too, but what is your opinion on wood versus carpet flooring? And how can we avoid mold development with carpet if that is the preference? Well, so carpet, it depends on where it's installed. If it's in the basement or on a slab. Uh, it's a uh, top floor in the bedrooms. Yeah. So uh, you just have to look at that as, a, as an allergen sponge, right? It's just receiving. It's, it's basically receiving all of the history of your building, right? So whoever lived there before, all of their lifestyle, you know, their, their kids, the, the crumbs, the pets, you know, if they're wearing shoes indoors, all that stuff just collects in there. And so uh, it's more of a more of a hygiene thing, quite frankly, carpets kind of gross, if you really think about it. Um, but uh, in basements and on slabs, it's a problem for mold. Uh, anytime it gets wet, even if it's above ground, above grade, it's a problem. So if it gets wet and it stays wet for more than 24, 48 hours, it really should be disposed of. But the other problem with carpet, the big problem with carpet is that it's loaded with chemicals, uh, whether they be flame retardants or or stain resistant chemicals, uh, they off gas. I mean, you know, a new carpet in a building is enough to, you know, send you into an uh, out of body experience. Right. So uh, this is really nasty stuff. And so my strong suggestion is if you're going to use carpet, use natural fiber carpets. Um, and if you move into a home and it's got carpet, rip that stuff out. You start from scratch. You wouldn't you wouldn't buy the mattress, would you? You know, so you would. Yeah. Right. So you, you do the same thing here, you know, have the same common sense. This is the, the, the carpet is like a is like a like a, uh, a historical record of, of everything that's gone on there since installation. Right. Thank, thank you. Yeah, we were we were um, opting towards wood flooring on top and um, it's a big expense. So it's a big um, expense. Uh, yeah. And but how often... on that, by the way, on the wood flooring, get yourself if you're going to do wood flooring, there's there are no VOC finishes. OK, now I talk about molding VOCs in the same breath, no pun intended, because th it is, these are these overlap like an incredible Venn diagram. Uh, because of course mold produces VOCs and the VOCs produce mold sensitivities. And so we we live in these buildings that are loaded with both oftentimes uh, if there's any water issue. Plus moisture exacerbates VOC uh, emissions. So uh, there's something called hydrolysis. So so really if you're going to be doing flooring of any sort of you use real wood, not the stuff that's was wood, not the part, not the stuff that's got laminate because that's got glues and adhesives. Those things also have VOCs. You use real wood and then use a finish. There's one called Bona Natural. Uh, I've used these in my homes. 
and uh and it's and it's got a no voc um uh, it's, it's no voc which is beautiful when they when they finished my floors i walked in then I, I couldn't smell it at all it was amazing so so and, you, and by the way word to the wise anyone who's doing renovations choose no voc materials uh they're abundant now they're somewhat hard to get usually you have to go to the green building supply in your local area in your region um but the people there usually really are really i mean incredibly helpful uh and there's a resource online called greenguard.org uh, and this is a great place to find uh, uh, materials, even like glues and adhesives and mastics and things that really harbor a lot of VOCs. I mean, if you go to Home Depot, you'll see you pick those things up and it doesn't even have like the California warning. Everything's everything causes cancer in California. But but th these things even just say straight out causes yeah. birth defects and cancer. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, well, <laughs> and they and they want you to use this in your home. You know, it's just amazing to me. So just be very aware that you have choices outside of what's on the shelves at Home Depot and Lowe's. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, good, good question, Manaza. Thank you for being here. And uh, well said, Jason. You, you might as well just say California causes cancer. <laughs> Feels no, that but it's yeah, posted everywhere. Everywhere you go, I live in California. It, you know, there's they they tell you materials in this building may cause cancer. If you're pregnant or lactating, don't come in here. You know, the, just just uh, it's the warnings are everywhere. Yeah, you very, lose it we have a very, yeah, very robust public uh, uh, consumer affairs division, department of whatever that is. Yeah, um, well stated. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Any more questions, Kate Marie? You, um, someone did in the chat say a most effective treatment for mold toxicity, recommended length of treatment for the yeah. house or person? For a house or general. person? Good it question. was general. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I don't really have a, a, a pat answer for that because it's so bio-individual. Um, and, and again, you know, if you've stopped toxing, you know, if you've got your air water, if you got your air food and attitude together, then then for a person, that, they uh, said for, for a person, person. Right? Yeah. So get your air food and attitude together first. And when you when you know that you're you, that you're breathing great air and you're eating food that that is that is optimal, optimal for uh, uh, for the reasons that I outlined during my talk, um, and, and you've, you know, worked through the, the fear aspect of this because you can be very hypervigilant. Um, then the clock begins. That's when detoxing begins, because by the way, a lot of people that say they have detox pathway issues, that's an epigenetic thing. You know, th that has to do with the fact that you may be overloaded. You can change that. That's not written in your, in, in, in the stars. Um, and, but you have to give your body a chance first before you start pushing on it. Um, and, and so I just encourage people to be patient. You know, the, one of the reasons why I think I got better as a kid, uh, is a, I didn't know anything about mold toxicity because there's no such thing. Um, but I moved out of that house and it was a slow process. Right. And it was just, and I spent a lot of time outdoors and I went from being highly allergic to everything to not having any allergies at all. Um, and so, you know, these things do, can and do change. And I know it's frustrating and I know it's disconcerting and it, and it, and, and, you know, you, but you have to be willing to, to, uh, to go the distance. Everybody wants a pill potion or a powder to fix this stuff. And they want to set a, a, an egg timer and say, it better be done now. Um, but, but the, the key element to this is patience and, and, uh, um, and, and having a little bit of, you know, having a little bit of vision, um, you know, believing that you will get better is the first step to actually getting better. So I don't have a, a hard and fast answer to that. I think I think my job is to set the foundation for people to get better. And then it's uh, it's up to Reed and, and FDNPs and other people that are doing great work like work like that to help take it to the to take you across the finish line. Thanks for that. Raylan. That's amazing. You're on. Yep. Yep. Okay. I'm not on mute. Just checking. Hi, Jason. Thank you so much. Phenomenal presentation. Loved every second of it and looking at looking forward to figuring out how we can get this message out to more people about how to take control of their health. Um, my question is about, it's, it's about that exactly. So if in your house, you know, you're cleaning like household cleaners, we're talking about minimizing VOCs. Um, what are some good options is hydrogen peroxide and vinegar? Are those like safer options than some of the traditional household cleaners? Because when my housekeeper comes over, our entire house gets 
it smells of fabuloso and I know that's not fabuloso at all so <laughs> I'm looking at like well what can we do and I keep trying to point her to like I will do distilled water and vinegar and give her little bottles of that in glass bottles not plastic because I don't want any extra chemicals because there's so many chemicals around what do you um what do you think about that well, first of all, thank you for the kind words, um, and uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, to connecting on the biochemic side of things too. Um, so, uh, I, I have a personal affinity for a cleaner called uh, Force of Nature, uh, and and it's really cool. They they sell these little um, they sell a it's really it's fun if you've got kids too. You put these little packets that are basically a salt and vinegar um, concentrate into dis, uh, distilled or filtered water and then it runs an electrical current through it and it actually creates hypo hypofluorous acid um and so this is great every cell in your body actually produces this stuff it's naturally anti-inflammatory too but it's also a really powerful uh disinfectant and it breaks uh grease well too and it leaves behind no odor or residue no chemicals it's completely inert and by the way you can spray it on your face it's really good for your complexion it's crazy um so it is yeah it's wild so force of nature is really cool um, so check them out. I know there's, they're, they, they, uh, we're working on, a, on, a, on something with them too. Uh, cause I recommend them all the time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, listen, hydrogen peroxide, um, you know, vinegar, light vinegar solution, all good. Um, so, uh, you know, that, 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 that all works fine. I just stay away from anything that has, uh, essentially over sanitizing. There are really three big things that, that cause problems in, in, in modern buildings. It's dampness, which of course leads to mold and allergens and things like that. It's chemicals, which are, you know, building materials as well as personal care products and cleaning products and all that stuff. So you got to purge that stuff and then stop bringing it in. And then lastly, it's hyper sanitization. We've destroyed our microbiome and, you know, we, the microbiome is around us, on us and in us. And, and it's like Matryoshka dolls, like the Russian Matryoshka stacking dolls, you know, you mess with one of them and there's a downstream and upstream effect. So we want a really robust microbiome around us too. So, you know, hard surfaces is where you'd really want to focus on for the, the force of nature. Uh, and then otherwise you just use a HEPA vacuum and then allow, and then open the windows, you know, use your HEPA filters, use your HEPA vacuums, all that stuff, and then open the windows and let nature back in. Um, so the key to clean, by the way, is not is to understand the definition, which is to remove dirt and debris, not to sanitize, right? We have changed the definition of what clean means. It is not sterile. Um, clean is free of dirt and debris. Wow, great point. My yeah. wife will be ordering a 50-gallon drum. <laughs> <laughs> it's good I stuff. Know. It, it's been raining for a week here and and this morning my husband and I said let's open all the windows and doors just kind of let the the moisture out <laughs> um we have time for one more quick question Sharon you have your hand raised so I will let you um go ahead and and ask your question hi thank you my question I wrote it in the chat but I can't recall if you said that your testing shows concentration basis or if it's just presence and if it's concentration basis, is there a range you would suggest to stay within for the general population versus people that are chronically ill? Yeah, you know, it's a, that's a really good question. And thank you for, for, for asking that. Um, you know, there's no way to really calibrate a lab result uh, like this against uh, the sensitive population because it, it can be so uh, extreme, the reactivity. And and again, we're looking for one clue within the range of clues that can be indicative of a mold problem, right? The musty smell, high spore count, visual indicators, all these things are relevant. None of them negate each other, right? Um, so, so, you know, what we look for is any sort of imbalance in the building. Uh, and, and when it comes to mold spore specifically, which is what our test tests for, we're looking for if we see and our software automatically interprets it. So you don't have to be uh, a mycologist uh, to understand this or an indoor air quality guy. Uh, if if you if we see different kinds of molds indoors and in, in concentrations to answer one of your questions, if we do show the concentrations and that's what indicates whether there's an alert condition, which means that it goes from green, which is not detected to slightly elevated, moderately elevated, or significantly elevated, um, that is in, that is based upon concentrations. It's also based upon the presence of molds that are in the building in quantities that don't exist in the outside sample. And so really what we're looking for is bio, a difference in biodiversity, both in concentration and numbers. But what we don't do with our tests, and this is very important, is that this is not a health test or a risk assessment, okay? Um, so, so you have to be the assessor for that. 
You have to say, how am I feeling in this building? And if something's bothering me, even if the sport counts are normal, that means you need to dig deeper. Okay. If you feel better when you leave the building, you are the best mold test. You need to listen to that. And it may very well be that you've got a hidden mold issue where you've got a musty smell that, or it sometimes, by the way, and this is really fascinating, the trigeminal nerve has the ability to detect chemical pollutants, something like 10 to 12 logs more sensitively than the olfactory sense. So you're talking about really, really sensitive nerve endings here. And that's why you get people that will sometimes walk into a building and go, oh, I can't be in here. There's mold here. And no one else can smell or detect it. And it's because their spidey sense has has picked that up. And so uh, it, it is it is a real thing. It explains a lot about how certain people react. And it's more sensitive than any diagnostic tool that we have, any test that we have. So you have to be the, the 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 person that's in charge. I mean, this is this is a lot of what I talk about is becoming self sufficient about this stuff. You know, not turning over your 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 care about your building or your body to third parties. You know, really starting to look, to tune in to this stuff because once you do that, then you'll find that there's a lot of empowerment in that, and 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 a lot of that fear goes away once you start realizing that maybe you were right this whole time. And everyone who marginalized you, you know, that wasn't listening to your to, to your complaints. It wasn't that they were wrong necessarily. It's just that you were the 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 you're you're you are more sensitive. And by the way, I'll leave you with this thought on this note. The people who are hypersensitive oftentimes view themselves as weak or 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 perceived as weak. Uh, are perceived as, you know, the the canary in the coal mine, or the squeaky wheel, whatever, you know, whatever somewhat pejorative term you can apply to it. I would argue that it's quite the opposite. I would say that that extra sensitivity is a superpower. Um, and, it, and, it, and it gives you the ability to detect things that are unhealthy for everybody. And it lets you take action on it before anybody else does, which means that you can stay healthy. Now, that, that may not necessarily feel good socially speaking, but screw them. You know, like it, it is, you got to take care of yourself. And by, by listening to that, you can also take care of your family. So that's why I say tune in and learn to trust uh, yourself on this stuff. And don't rely whole solely on lab data uh, because lab data gives you part of the story, right? These are just snapshots uh, and you need to collect a lot of data points. And a big part of that has to do with your own subjective experience. Hey, uh, Jason, let me ask you a question. Do you, do you have a couple extra minutes? Sure. Okay, and this is common on our HSU. Uh, you know, every first uh, Saturday of the month, we have a very special guest. I want to inform everyone that next uh, first Saturday of the month is going to be more inclined towards our business aspects of being FDN. We have Sean Croxton on. He's been a, uh, an FDN since it started in 2008. He's um, made a lot of people a lot of money. So next uh, first Saturday, we're going to have a guest on talking about the business of FDN, the business of health coach and being in the health space as an entrepreneur. And uh, then we'll probably go right back to um, someone on, who's more on the scientific side. I wanted to do two things. We do have someone else with a hand up. So you said you had an extra minute. These things yep. will go over sometimes. We still have, you know, 98% of the audience that started with us. So that's good. I'm going to share my screen for just a sec. And the reason I'm doing this is to show you that, yeah, we absolutely vet out every guest. I've usually known them for a long time. This is the first gut mold test that I ran uh, back in August of 23. So, you know, a long time ago, um, samples collected by me. Um, we, we did our uh, bathroom, upstairs bathroom in our in our um, main bedroom. And uh, we didn't find anything worth looking at there, which is good. You, you want to get, this is what you want to see. You want to have a clean home. And you can see the gradient there is from not evident to significantly evident. And down here, the things actually tested for as I'm scrolling and I'm going fast because you need to do this for yourself. What, what's on my lab report means nothing to you, but that you can see what they have um, tested for here and you can get it all explained to you. I, I had a nice session with Jason after doing this. You also get all of their recommendations and things and how to go further. I'm going to stop sharing that. I just wanted to show you that we have done, we've done a couple of these now in our house in different areas. And I would say that if you suspect mold, if you have any water damage at all, um, do this, get your clients to do this. Okay, Marie, we just put our link in the uh, chat box or window one more time, please, so that people can get these for themselves. 
And next is Susie, who has a question. Thanks, Reed. Unmute. Yep, sure, Jason. Unmute, Susie. Hey, Reed. thank you so much. Did you say the TN um, has a 10 to 40% uh, more detection than everything else, the trigeminal nerve? Oh, no. I mean, I, I've, I've read that it can go 10 to 12 logs more sensitively than the olfactory sense. So, I mean, it's like way below odor threshold, way, way, way below odor threshold. So how does that relate to people that had trigeminal neuralgia? Uh, I'm not an expert in trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, and by the, by the way, we are putting together the Got Mold Virtual Summit. And one of, the, one of my missions here is to bring in a few experts in that space so that I can get a really good education. Um, trigeminal neuralgia is very painful, uh, extremely disruptive. Um, I used to and have so, it. So I, I, you know, I, my, the more I learn about that, the more I'm grateful I never had it. And I'm sorry to hear that you went through it. Um, but, uh, but what we're talking about here is something that plays in the same sandbox, but is not, not the same thing. This is, okay. this, this is an irritation of the nerve endings really. Right. Um, and, uh, and it's fascinating stuff, uh, you know, for a long time, by the way, the trigeminal nerve was known to be, uh, a, a component of, of environmental sensitivities, but it was poo-pooed or it was it, and people who have sensitivities also hated it because they, they, it was just dismissed as, you know. Uh, this is this uh, sort of marginal thing, and so the uh, numbing and, and the tingling and all that stuff. The numbing, is, tingling. A lot of people end up with with the sensations in their face when they're having mold exposure. Uh, yeah. num, num, the numb teeth, um, you know, strange tastes in their mouth. Uh, also, uh, inflammation in the esophagus. I, I've I've heard uh, uh, people talk about a relationship between that and, and eosinophilic esophagitis and all sorts of inflammatory uh, conditions that are in the same vicinity. Um, so okay. I'm learning more and more about it every day. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, you know, it's, of course, it's hard to test these things because it's hard to ethically speaking, have people sniff mold and then see what happens to their, <laughs> to their physiology. Thank you. Yeah. So a lot of, you know, <laughs> you can imagine that the data is scant uh, when it comes to actual human, um, uh, human data, but, uh, it's emerging and it's fascinating. And, uh, and so keep your eyes peeled for that. Okay. And the UVC lights that they recommend on the internet, what do you think of those? Oh, gosh. So that's a, that's a no, huh? Yeah. Listen, you, anytime you, first of all, HVAC systems, okay. You're talking about in the, in your HVAC system. Well, and some people say put them in every freaking room. Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I would, you know, blue light, ah, you know, yeah. like, yeah. I mean, like, seriously, that's disruptive in so many different levels. Uh, not only that, that's a sanitizer, theoretically. Uh, it's also a very poor sanitizer. The data on this is that if you actually put microbes on a surface and you put the light directly into it, there's a certain amount of time that it will kill the microbes. You're also mm -hmm. killing things like bacteria, which release endotoxins. So bacteria keep their toxins inside the cell. So you're actually better off not killing these things because then they okay. rupture and then you actually release the endotoxins. And then okay. now they're in. So, so my, my, uh, my feeling is that, uh, Filters on HVAC systems should be used to keep the system clean. If you want to filter your air for your building, for your house, for your lungs, they should be in local room-based uh, units. Okay. Um, and, and, the, and the H and UVC, anything that the HVAC guy is recommending, quite frankly, is probably, you know, this is- that, No, that was the industrial engineer that I hired that did do scare tactics and everything else, like you yeah, said. Yeah, industrial engineer, industrial hygienist, right? Yes, thank you. Yeah. They're, they're not qualified. That's what just the term industrial just tells you, right? They're, they're, their job, what they're trained to do is, is create a work environment that's free of hazards, you know, chemicals and ergonomics and things like that. They get trained to do mold only because they have all the equipment. And in the insurance industry early on said, well, we're, we're going to get to do all these tests. And so they, 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 they got the American Industrial Hygiene Association to sign on. And then they had a, a place that they could refer all of their business to. So industrial hygienists really have no place in this business, quite frankly. They have no formal training in buildings, building science, or mold and, mo mold and moisture related issues. And if you can help me, one more question, logical stuff. Um, husband died and I'm having a real hard time doing this on my own. Um, so I hired this person and a lot of scare tactics was going on. However, there's, we found mold, there's mold in the duct work. And I know you said you've never had to get rid of anything, but I mean, if there's mold in the duct work, wouldn't you replace it? It depends on what the duct work's made of. So there's two the different flex. kinds of duct over the, the flex. Oh, flex ducts. You just replace the ducts. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, and, and and flex ducts really should not be. I mean, this is this is classic, you know, American modern American construction. We built like you know disposable homes. This was in the um, no. This was my home was built in the sixties. But they're using flex ducts. It must have been a retro retrofit. Oh, they maybe zone in. Yeah, because yeah. those didn't even exist in the sixties. So, uh, so no, I never replaced the the equipment, uh, and I never replaced duct work if it's made of metal. Uh, okay. Now there are some, especially in commercial buildings, where you've got insulated ducts that are made with duct board, and that's like a five, like it's got like a, a, it's it's got an absorptive, it's for sound mostly, uh, and to prevent condensation. Those things need to be replaced all the time. They collect dust and they get they get moldy, really nasty. I mean, horrible. But flex ducts, um, the problem you have in a it, it, usually it's in an attic where ducts ducts get moldy. Mine's um, in the in the crawl space, well, that's a whole different conversation. Go to our website and go to the learning center and 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 look up the the article uh, on crawl spaces, and uh, and you'll see thank crawl you. are a building defect. And, yeah. and thank you, Susie. Good thank questions. You. Very good thank questions. Uh, Everyone, we're thank you so much you. for being here. Reed, you want to um, one last if thing? I just, uh, you know, I, I just want to say I like how you put it as spidey sense. We all have this spidey sense. You know, like you, you feel like someone's looking at you and you look over and they have some bastards looking at you, right? So you this is spidey sense. It's beyond smell and the regular senses. Um, I get it when I go into hospitals. I think I got to get out of here. This place is going to kill me. You know, like, I don't know how. Maybe it's a slightly aromatic and slightly something else. But good on you, Jason, for bringing this whole aspect of fear into it, that, that you know, how you think matters. That's often how I start or, you know, I do a lot of interviews. I get interviewed a hundred times a year and I, they, what's that one thing you wish everyone would do? I wish everyone would get up in the morning and be thankful. Mm. Then go be creative, you know, be thankful for Amen. what you have. You know, it's a state of mind and then go be creative, go do something useful. And that's my secret to success. I know you feel the same way, Jason, back yeah. to you, King Marie to end it up. Well, Thank you, you uh, that was a perfect segue because, you know, I love to end these uh, meetings with one something that stood out by the speaker. And I think your standout to me was believing you will get better is the first step to getting better. That was brilliant um, on know. that. And I invite all of you to take a moment for yourself today. Step out into the um, beautiful world that we live in. Find a moment of gratitude and a moment to take a deep breath of fresh air, whether it's negative whatever or 100 degrees. Just get outside, get some movement, and uh, care for yourself because that's where it starts. Everyone, thank you so much. We will see you back here Saturday, March 2nd, same time with another wonderful speaker. And Reed Davis and myself, K. Marie Moreno, thank you, everyone, for being here. Have a beautiful day. Thank you.